Hey, good evening. Good to see you all here. Uh, happy Wednesday. Hope everybody's having a good week. So we're going to have a lot of fun tonight. So today's plan is to work on the OpenBSD WireGuard interface for WG Control Go. Uh, but first, I want to show you all a little something I've been working on. So ready? Ta-da! So this is a Novation Launchpad. Uh, right now, I have a Go programmer on it, running on here, a few different Go routines, like writing stuff to the... Uh, screen and everything, and if I press some buttons, some of the lights disappear, all kinds of fancy stuff going on. So my plan for this is to essentially make my own Stream Deck. So there's this device called a Stream Deck you can buy, it's like 100, 150 bucks, has like a few buttons and stuff, but I have this launch pad right here that has at least 64 usable buttons, I could probably set multiple layers, like basically I want to write my own Go thing to do this and create my own streaming software. So we're going to do that. Should be a good time. So that's probably going to be a project for on stream as well. But right now I just have a prototype I'm messing around with MIDI and stuff. So yeah, should be fun. So tonight's plan is to talk about WireGuard on OpenBSD. So let me find my scene here really quick. There we go. Okay. So pretty much where we left off last time is we have started to implement the new interface, which is the IOCTL interface for WireGuard on OpenBSD. Over the past couple of days, a few things have changed. It was previously the interface used linked lists, and now there are arrays instead. And we learned a few new things about the CGO code generator today, so we're going to go over all of that. But for the time being, so pretty much where we left off last time is I had generated a few structures. We had begun parsing the definitions. Let me see here. Let's close some folders we don't need. Um, we'd begun parsing the definitions. Uh, parsing these structures out from the kernel. So basically the first step is we gather all the devices in the WG group. Uh, this is how OpenBSD identifies devices that belong to like a certain driver or something like that. We figure out which ones belong to WireGuard and then we begin querying the status of each by its name. When we query the status of each one, we pass this IOCTL WG data IO. So that part remains exactly the same. This is going to tell us how much data it's going to return. So before I had this hard coded to a fixed number, but as it turns out, it actually concatenates a series of structures back to back. So we want to be sure that we just get at least a WG interface IO for an interface. And now what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to pull out these structures that are trailing this. So, oh, hey, good to see you. So uh, today we have a couple of uh, special folks in chat. Uh, we have Jason, the creator of WireGuard. So no pressure on me, hope I get the de details right. And uh, Encon, I don't remember your real name, I'm sorry. Uh, Encon here as well is the author of the OpenBSD kernel module. So pretty cool stuff. So this is going to be a really fun stream. Uh, I am not a C expert, so me trying to translate C code into Go code will probably be pretty entertaining for some of the folks here. But I'm pretty excited, so it should be, should be a really good time. Uh, let's see here. Oh, okay. Just a ping in IRC, I wanted to make sure things were fine. But cool. So what we have now is the, the code that is here today will no longer compile because the structure definitions have changed slightly. Uh, let's see. So there is no longer this, let's see. So this WGA IP data type, uh, allowed IP data type no longer exists. So we remove that. Uh, we now have the allowed IP IO type up here because I believe the CGO code generator requires things to be in the correct order so it can figure out dependencies. Um... And yeah, so if we look at the generated code, there are a few changes to this. So first, this WG data IO structure, instead of just having a pointer to uh, memory, arbitrary memory, I guess, we now have a pointer to a WG interface IO. And what's going to happen now is instead of this being linked lists, it's going to be arrays laid back to back in memory. So we have a WG interface IO. That will tell us some of the basic details about an interface. And then you'll see here, there's this peers count counter. This indicates how many peer uh, structures are trailing this message. So we're gonna have to parse this, figure out how much memory each of those peer structures would need, and then allocate enough memory and slice into that and go. But the tricky part is here, is that for some reason the CGO code generator is not actually giving us the peers uh, field or the pointer itself. So I think what I'm gonna have to do right now probably is essentially figure out where the end of the structure is in memory, seek to that point, and then do the pointer arithmetic myself to pull the structure out from behind that. So essentially we have the interface IO structure back, or right after that we have the peer IO and then possibly zero or more allowed IPs. And then we're going to repeat that. So for each peer, there could be zero or more allowed IP structures as well. So this should be a pretty entertaining time. But as far as I can tell, I have an up-to-date virtual machine. We've got an interface that seems to be working. The implementation pings just fine and everything. So 
Uh, I believe things are stable, so we're going to have a pretty good time with this. So, let's let's just see where we are right now. Uh, I was in this folder. Uh, is this going to compile? Probably not. Or actually, not a chance, because some of the things have changed. So, let's get things compiling first, and then look at the new API. So, oh, I'm yeah, right, I'm running my, B, my BSD VM. So, what I want to do actually here is use my SSHFS mount. It's going to be easier if I use my own tools. So, we are going to... Oh, but that's right, I can't compile this on Linux because it's OpenBSD. So, ah. Fun. Okay. Right. So we have a few things uh, that are wrong we're going to have to fix. So you know what's kind of funny is uh, one of my friends was telling me, he was watching me mess around with VS Code, like, oh, line 146 and scroll for it. And I'm pretty inefficient with VS Code. So I got uh, nerd sniped a little bit. So I printed out a cheat sheet of keyboard shortcuts. <laughs> I'm going to try and actually learn the keyboard shortcuts. That'd be great. So here's one. Control G. Uh, go to line 146. Right? That's like beginner level stuff. Oh, I messed it up. That's like beginner level stuff, but, you know, it's one of those things that I really should just figure out how to do. The problem is I'm lazy and I tend to forget these things. So, we'll see. So now, this is no longer a mem field. It is actually the, uh, let's see here, interface instead, right? Yeah, so instead of passing an array of bytes, I'm going to populate the structure directly, right? So I don't need to do this unsafe cast anymore. I can just create the structure, point at it, pass the ioctal to the kernel, and then we should get the structure back. So I guess let's start with that really quick. Let's uh, uh, panic. No. How about nil, nil for the time being? So wrong. Don't do that. Oh, what am I, what am I doing wrong here already? <laughs> cast your memory unsafely. <laughs> Well, thankfully, the, the Go definitions here are type safe at the moment, but we're going to get to the unsafe stuff, I'm sure. It's going to be a really good time. Um, I'm going to slide this over really quick and pull these definitions up because I'm not going to be able to remember otherwise. So, so we have the WG interface IO we need to allocate here. We already have it allocated. We have this data IO, right? So within the... The idea is that data interface points to a chunk of memory of size data size. Right, yeah, I was just trying to I was just trying to get my mental state back here because some of the variable names changed too. So the size is going to be populated after this first call. Uh, by the way, so this is a, a little trick I'm doing right here. So if you look at the definition of this function, uh, it's not working because I'm on Linux, but basically I have it so that in real code, it's going to do this actual ioctal system call, but in tests, we can actually emulate that a little bit. Uh, but it still types this interface, so it's pleasing to use. Yes, thankfully the CGO code generator saved me in this case, although the unsafe stuff wasn't that bad either. So we have the data size. That field's still the same. Now we have an interface. Okay, so the interface is already going to be... Is it going to be populated? Do I have to allocate it myself? I think I would want to allocate it, right? So I'm pretty sure I'm going to have to data interface equals a WGH WG interface IO. So we actually need to allocate this. So that way the kernel has something to pass this into, I, I believe. Um, do we need the... Oh, we still need the size because the size is going to tell us how many elements are behind it. Okay. For a sec, I wondered if we didn't need the size anymore because we know how large the structure is going to be, but that's not true. So uh, actually, I think uh, a lot of my tests are going to bite me. I'm probably going to want to remove my tests as well, but... Oh, uh, let's see here. So this can go away. Uh, we have now allocated the memory for this. We're going to pass this to the kernel. We will now get back the structure. So the structure as is should be able to be print to the screen. M0. Is that what I want? Because I've, so since the go, since the go definition is already typed, I feel like passing this is going to have the same effect. So I think this might work as is. But if not, we can do we can do exactly that. We can pass a pointer to the uh, the byte slice like we did before. But I, I I could be wrong here, but I suspect this will work. I I guess we'll see. So we're just gonna I just want to find out really quick. Um, right. The pointer pointed to by interface needs to be able to fit everything. Oh, right. That's a good point. Very good point. Okay. Yeah. So the the problem is here is that if I am passing right, you're right. So since I'm passing this WG interface I/O. 
Uh, that ex actually will not work. We need to allocate enough memory because we need to allocate space for everything behind this as well and not just this. Yes, that's a very good point. Yeah, this is gonna be this is gonna be an interesting stream. This is uh some pretty as far as go as far as go goes, we call this like the dark arts territory. So it's gonna be it's gonna be a good time. Yep, so we allocate enough space. Uh, now we need to cast this to an interface IO. Yes, so Jason is correct about that. Uh, we have now allocated the space. We need to unpack this from data mem. No. So now this would be oh shoot. Memory zero. An unsafe pointer starting at memory zero, but memory is already a byte slice. We need to pass this as a... So we need to cast this to a pointer to an interface I.O. so we can put it in the structure. <laughs> if it's any consolation, Xsys Windows is filled with poopy C patterns like this. Yeah. I mean, it. you know, when you look at the C code for this, it's actually quite elegant, I think, right? But the, the Go code is not so much. So uh, data interface equals... We need to do some casting... Yeah. Yes. So, uh, WGH, WG, interface IO, uh, unsafe pointer to the address of mem0. So we're taking, again, so we want to make sure we pass the zero here because if we take just the address of mem, we are taking the address of the slice header. We don't want the slice header here. We want the backing array, which has enough space for all the elements of data we're going to be fetching. So... If I look at this now, so the data interface will be populated, but there's also going to be a bunch of data behind it that's going to be effectively invisible to our Go program as of now. Uh, it will, at least from the perspective of the interface here, but from Mem, we'll be able to see the whole thing. Another interesting consideration, do you want this allocation to happen in a loop because there could be concurrent changes? Interesting. So I saw that in the I saw that in the code that I wasn't exactly sure why that was the case, but yeah, that's that's tricky. Might, so data size might change between when you fetch it and when you use it. Very fun. <laughs> uh, because another user on the system might change the interface. Huh, okay. I think for the time being, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see how this goes, but I think we, can, we should add a to-do for that for sure. Um, let's see here. So to-do, need to do this in a loop because it's possible system state to change concurrently oh shoot i forgot to update my stream title um right let me fix that really quick uh updating wg control go for the wire guard open bsd kernel interface go and networking fun yep i think that was on my checklist too and i just totally ignored it but okay there we go Right, uh, so we can see here we've got the WG tool running, so that seems to work. So now we need to verify the, uh, let's see here. I guess I'm gonna get a couple of terminals going on the BSD system, BSD. And the, let's see here, WG control go, command, go run main. Ah, fun. Line six, oh, there are no devices, right? Print device. Am I returning a device? I could have sworn I was not. Oh, yeah, I am. I'm returning a nil device. Yeah, that's the problem. Okay. To Failed to get devices to do. Okay. Um, hmm. All right, Jason, I'm going to steal that. Uh, I'm going to steal that pattern really quick and uh, put that in here for... A note. Thank you. Appreciate it. So the data interface is all zeros. That doesn't seem to make sense. Let's let's the rest of the data here. Still pseudocode. Bad pseudocode twitch is hard. Yeah, totally. <laughs> That's okay. We're all in this we're all in this together. Oh, okay, so this is a this is a correction of the last thing. Okay. Cool, cool. Um, hmm. Oops, not what I wanted to do. Right, so now we have the... What are the fields of this? So the data IO is the name of the device. Okay, so this is WG0, right? Size 248, yes. 
Uh, bpaste.net. Oh, is that like a code pasting site or something? Hmm. Then we have a pointer, but then the pointer has nothing. And hello. Yes. Cool. Data interface. Yeah, I feel like I usually end up using like a GitHub gist, but realistically, there, there's all kinds of stuff out there either way. Um, so I would expect this to be populated with something. We use play.golang.org around here. Yeah, I don't think play.golang.org works for uh, C code though. <laughs> Okay, so what am I? Let's check the let's check the first few bytes of the memory directly. So mem up to thirty two. Also zeros, huh? So I'm passing a pointer to. I'm passing the memory, which looks like a pointer to an interface I/O to go. But I'm getting nothing back, or it's still zeros. Is that because I no? I have a peer associated. I should see. I, I should see more data than that. I should see at least the interface I/O. What am I missing here? So tonight's going to be a pretty tricky stream. Uh, this is all this is all brand new to me. I just started like you know messing with this interface like today, basically. So or at least this newer interface. So tonight's going to be pretty tricky. Probably slow going. But we'll get through it. You know, we'll learn together. We've got a couple of experts here, thankfully. So, <laughs> huh? So, what am I? What am I missing here? So the structure is populated. The structure is allocated, but it's not being we're passing the address of the first element of the memory. We're shoving it into this field and we're passing it again in the ioctal call. I apologize if people say IO control or IO cuddle. I say ioctal. Uh, <laughs> my bad. <laughs> it's another one of those like pronunciation things, right? So let's see here. That, yeah, nothing, nothing unusual about that. Huh. Do I need to, am I passing the wrong pointer somehow? No. Passing the address of the first element of the array. Size is still the same. So the data we're passing to it is, so just really quick. Uh, before, good old print line debugging, right? After, right. Oh, wait, so before is 80, after is 2. Oh, 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 oh. So I really do need to do this in a loop because beforehand we're only allocating 80 bytes. Interesting. I like spew.dump for that. Yeah, me too, totally. I, I, you know, I tried to use that the other day, but for some reason I didn't have it like installed or something. I didn't have it in my, uh, it, it wasn't being picked up by uh, Go Imports, et cetera. Oh, why is my camera out of, one sec. Oh, oh yes. I could have sworn I told my camera it's not autofocus anymore because I saw it just do that weird thing. But let me check my devices. Can I do that without a... Huh. Let's see. I don't know if I can mess with that right now easily at least. Um, hmm. We'll go without. It's not that big of a deal. Anyway, so yeah, I need to I need to allocate more memory. Uh, that's what it looks like to me. So I'm giving it 80 bytes because that's what it tells me the first time around. The second time around, it's telling me 248. So I think that what Jason mentioned about this being a loop might be necessary. So if mem is greater than or equal to data mem. Yeah, huh. I guess I feel like, I, I feel like this API should tell me the... I, I would suspect that this first call would tell me the correct amount of memory, right? So it's giving me 80 bytes the first time around, but then 248 the second. So I'm a little... I'm confused. Hmm. Well, we can do it in a, we can do it in a loop. Um, let's see here. So four. Start a big old loop going on. Uh, right. 
Uh, let's look at the pseudocode here. Memory equals nil, last size equals zero. Hey, I'm back. I took Dominic's suggestion. Use Go Playground. <laughs> no big deal. Fun. Yeah, size is greater than or equal to the length of memory. Yeah, okay. So the first time around, this is going to give me... Right, so this is going to give me 80 bytes the first time around always. And then I ask it again and it gives me the amount I need. Is that what I'm, is that what I'm understanding out of this? I guess I would have expected the first time around to tell me like, hey, you need to give me 248 bytes. So, but I guess that would probably explain why this is zero, right? Should I give you the same amount every time? Really? Um, unless another process in the system changes the interface in the meantime. Yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing running over here that would change the interface, so... Right, so if I, if I look at this, uh, let me run this again. Oh, uh, infinite loop now, okay. <laughs> Oops. The other thing that will change the size is root versus non-root. Oh, interesting, okay, cause so did you all, did you all hide the uh, information? Because there we go, so I'm running as root anyway, so everything should be fine, but uh, real quick, I just wanna show you what I was seeing really quick. So, before this second IOCTAL call, I'm seeing 80 bytes, and then after I'm seeing 248, and there's nothing concurrently changing the state of the system as far as I can tell. So, that is that is why I was confused. I was curious why it wouldn't give me 248 the first time around. I mean, I could do this in a loop, but that's probably, like, as you mentioned, that seems to be the correct way to do this anyway. But... I was just confused as to why... Uh, that does seem weird looking. Okay, cool. We might have found a bug. <laughs> All right, uh, I will. I will continue, and I'll, I will implement the loop logic really quick while you're looking at that. Yeah, it just seems like one of those. Uh, seems like one of those odd, odd things to me. Um, what's the size here? Is that? It's probably eighty bytes, isn't it? Oh, right. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think it would be 80 bytes because it would be two 32-bit keys. I see. Yeah, that's a bug. Hey, we found our first bug on stream today. <laughs> Very fun, right? <laughs> cool. Uh, I can. I suppose I can continue working with this for the time being, and then whenever you are ready, I can run the build, uh, the quick builder script and update my VM. So, no big deal. Uh, no rush. Yeah, this is, uh, it's pretty funny, it's pretty funny finding unexplainable things on stream and then finding out it's actually a bug. I, uh, makes me feel good, makes me feel like I'm not going as insane, <laughs> you know? Uh, right, so we need to pull the memory allocation out. Yes, so var mem array byte. Slice of byte. You know, I'm gonna keep saying array forever, pretty much, right? But in Go, we're almost always working with slices, so I should probably try and get my terminology more correct. So, uh, last size equals zero, right, so mem last int so we do act the we do the ioctal ioctal and then if the length of memory is greater than or equal to the oh we have to cast this to a oh shoot so this is this is uh how do we get the length of let's see size you went 64 oh the length of uh data no if length of memory is greater or equal than to data size right right i was I went down a quick mental rabbit hole where I thought I was going to have to get the length of this pointer to a WG interface IO, and I just could not, like, even fathom what sort of ungodly, you know, Cthulhu summoning <laughs> unsafe would be required, <laughs> right? Uh, allocated enough memory. 
Okay. So, it's the first line of the pseudocode JSON sent us. Uh, last size equals zero. Oh, this is just a, a different version of the same thing. So if last size is greater than or equal to data size, break. So the last size, do we need to track the last size? Yeah, I guess we would because we would need to be able to see it out here, right? So last equals when, no, data size. Ignore my pseudocode, look at the, oh, okay, sure. Yep, I've, I've got it, thanks. Uh, If the data size is greater than or equal to, I think we'd want the opposite though, right? Because we would want to make sure we have enough memory. Because if we do data size is greater than or equal to the length of the memory, then we haven't allocated enough memory. We need a bell to flash your screen, Matt. Uh, what for? <laughs> Does it look like I'm not uh, doing anything? Because hopefully at least the, the webcam is working, but. No way that could go wrong. Yeah. I know there's all those things with like channel point rewards and such. You're right. I got that condition first. Okay, cool. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't like, uh, it's one of those things where like, you know, talking through it aloud helps you, helps me uh, rationalize your understand. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I think we've effectively got the, uh, the correct pseudocode now, roughly. Um, so after we would, so we want to check the contents of memory up to last. Yeah. Um, or is it minus one? I feel like this is gonna be like one of those off by one things as well. So anyway, let's run it, find out. Uh, right, so int and you int 64. Okay, um, well, I suppose it's probably best to cast into the larger type. Well, I mean, integer is always going to be signed. So I mean, I guess, I guess this is probably, I guess it's probably fine. Uh, cannot use data size as type int in assignment. Oh, it's uint64, right. Well, we're going to have to clamp it to an int because we need to be able to index with it. So actually, I think I do want the other way. So bug fix is here. Sweet. Hey, we got our first uh, bug fix live on stream. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. So I was going to show you all this. This is the uh, you know the quick little demo of the OpenBSD kernel module working. Uh, also, the something cool to announce, the patches have been posted to the OpenBSD tech mailing list. So with any luck, this will be uh, upstream, possibly in a future release of OpenBSD, which is very cool. So now we're at the point where we will have two native kernel implementations of WireGuard, which is awesome. So, uh, right. So if I will go ahead and take this link from, or I guess I can, I can link to the tweet. You can check out this thread and you can see uh, everything that's going on here. Oh, not enough battery on my laptop right now to compile tests, but I'll plug in in 20 minutes. Okay, cool. I mean, it's a VM. I don't care if I if I burn it right. Um, let's just see if we can get this to compile really quick. Uh, although I, I recognize there's the bug. I expected comma 144. Oh, Perrin. Uh, I believe I have an infinite loop. Um, let's see here. Mem. Hmm. Yeah, that doesn't seem right. We'll fix it in a sec. I'm going to update my VM. So we actually have this cool little script uh, Jason wrote that will update the virtual machine to pull the latest master versions of all of the things. So if I go to WireGuard OpenBSD, uh, get pull. Uh, by the way, if there are any OpenBSD fans out there, I am not an OpenBSD user. I am very much a Linux person. So I do not know all of the fancy ways to do things, but so we're we're making it work, you know, but a uh, quick builder. So this is effectively going to pull the latest changes and everything and rebuild a kernel that you can boot into, uh, place it in the root file system and you do a reboot and you've got the latest code. So pretty good for testing. And this VM I believe has four virtual cores and eight gigs of RAM. So it shouldn't take very long. Um, you know, it might take a sec, but. I suppose in the meantime, was there anything else I wanted to show you all? Um, so 
So here is the here's the patch that Jason sent me just now. Uh, super user check, huh? Okay. Uh, yeah, I suppose I can drop the... Oh, shoot. No, don't want to do that. I suppose I can drop the link to the... Oh, Twitter doing the short link thing. That's not what I want. Uh, here is the link to the OpenBSD tech uh, post from uh, Matt. So, NCON is Matt. He is also here. Uh, hello, other Matt. <laughs> uh, yeah, very, very exciting news. Super happy to hear about this. I originally implemented an interface for the OpenBSD uh, API, kernel API, about a year ago. And I had it mostly working as far as a read-only API goes. I think I had the read-only stuff totally done, but the configuration was not done. Uh, and then I kind of set it down for a while because I just, I think I got busy with other projects and whatever else. But now that this is making its way upstream, uh, we have the opportunity to add support for this to all of the tools. It's already been added to the WG tool, which is what most folks use to interact with WireGuard. But putting it in the WG control go will mean that you can run things like the uh, my WireGuard Prometheus exporter on OpenBSD as well, which is pretty cool. So that should be that should be pretty awesome. Always fun watching uh, C compiles fly, huh? <laughs> I hope that compiles. Yeah, I guess we're gonna find out, won't we? <laughs> Uh, let's see. In the meantime, was there anything else I wanted to mention? I can't remember. Oh yeah, here's a fun little bit of uh, Go trivia. So we were trying to figure out today, I was talking to Fatih Arslan, and Fatih showed me this snippet really quick. So if you look at this, we have a type that is a pointer to a result and it's allocated. We'd pass a pointer to that. So now we have a pointer to a pointer and this is able to figure it out. For the second case, we have a pointer that's allocated. We pass it directly and it figures it out. For the third case, we have a pointer to a type here and then we pass a pointer to that and it also works fine. So effectively it is creating a pointer to a nil pointer, which is not pointing at anything and somehow Go is able to work around this or the reflection is able to work around this. And for the fourth case, this is where things actually crash because you're taking this nil pointer right here and passing it directly and it's no longer assignable. So there we go. So panic right here. I thought this was pretty interesting because effectively the, if you do, for example, something ridiculous like this, it'll still work. Oh, actually, wait a sec. Oh, I need to dereference it that many times, don't I? Yeah, let's, uh, let's do something a little more sane. There we go. Yeah, uh, pretty pretty interesting stuff. Uh, res3 is allocated, or address of res3 is allocated, that's your actual variable memory. Right. Uh, res3 works because reflection can set the value of res3. It can't do that for res4. Yeah, I thought this was interesting. I was just trying to, we were looking at this and we were trying to like infer, you know, why this would be the case. I was kind of confused as to how like Go could skip over the nil pointer potentially, or potentially in this chain or something, but I am not at all an expert on these sorts of things. So, okay. Uh, cleaning up. Sweet. So, perfect timing. <laughs> and then we will reboot the VM, SSH back in, and uh, hopefully get things rolling again. Great. Uh, res3 isn't a nil pointer. It's the address of a pointer variable allocated on the stack. Right. Right. Yeah, it's one of those things where if you just, like, think about how the memory management works, like, it makes sense, but it just kind of threw me for a loop for, uh, for a minute. Uh, yeah, so we'll give that a second to reboot. It should generally come up pretty quickly. Um, I think most of the cycles for this have been like less than a minute or so, which is pretty good. So can't complain about that. Greater than or equal to. Yeah, length of memory is going to be zero here the first time around. So we're going to skip this check. We're going to go automatically down to the second one. We expect at least the size of a single interface I.O. We <laughs> we allocate memory. Oh, ah, I made a mistake. I shadowed. No wonder it did an infinite loop. So 
I had the colon equals here, so I was assigning to a local mem that was not this one. Fun, right? Uh, cool, okay. So, excuse me. Uh, where did my, oh, right, I'm using WG quick now. Uh, no, no sudo, I'm already root, and sudo doesn't exist on OpenBSD, it's do as instead. Up, uh, WG zero. Uh, you no longer need last. But I'm pretty sure I do because I need to be able to slice into the uh, memory down below. So just get rid of that variable. Len mem should always equal last. I think you're, yeah, I believe, actually, I think you, yeah. Yeah, because we would allocate exactly the size to tell us, you're, yep, okay. That's a good point. Right, right, and right. So uh, let's, we'll post the memory or the length first. Uh, let's see here. So I need to get back to command. Uh, let's open up a couple terminals again. So, oops, macro layer. Uh, ah, infinite loop, still. Uh, what did I do? Okay, uh, length of memory is zero. Am I shadowing it again? So we have mem. We have another mem down here. Right. I think I might need to do this assignment up above as well, possibly. Well, because right now we have two of the ioctals. I think I need to get rid of one of them and do everything up here. So length of memory is zero and it's doing that on repeat. So we're gonna skip past this. Uh, data size. So we allocate here. We don't clear it at all within this loop. So by the time it gets back around to the front of the loop, we should see a greater length. Is there something else silly I'm missing here? Get rid of. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was wondering about that. I think that I think I might actually want to. You only need one per loop. Yeah, yep. So we allocate this the first time around, and then by the time it gets back up here, and then we also have the the error handling here, which is good. Hmm. I don't think I. Do this in a loop. Okay, we're now we're already doing it in a loop. What? <laughs> yeah. Uh, is this a... Uh, okay, let's... Uh, what is data size telling us now? Is SSH working after VM reboot? Yes, I am SSH into the VM. Uh, I'm over... So if I do if config wg0, you can see right here I'm on it. Uh, by the way, this WireGuard key is not actually used for anything, so don't, don't worry. Oh! You're right, SSHFS, you are totally right. Yes, good call. That's, uh, wow, thank you. It would have taken me much longer to catch that. Uh, yes, you are right. I was using SSH, uh, SSHFS. We were editing a local copy of the code. Uh, let me see here. Yep, 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 yep. Gold star for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was uh, an experience. So now we have the shadowed code still. There we go. Yep. Yeah, that was very strange. I could not figure out how mem could still possibly be zero. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. This is why we this is why we stream, right? That would have taken me probably a good at least 30 or 40 minutes on my own. So <laughs> Oh right, if config is kind of forked right now. Cool, there we go, perfect. So we can see now we get length zero uh, and then we get length 248. So, oh, length zero is only because it's the first time around. So we do the first, uh, wait a sec. Oh, right, because it's zero. Then we check the size, we iterate back around the loop, we allocate enough memory. Okay, this is working now. Wow. First you call it and you have no idea, then you try again. Right, right. I think I was misreading my debug output. 
If you want to make it faster at the expense of memory, you could guess. Yeah, I, I'm gonna I'm good with doing the simple thing for now. I think that uh, pre-allocate a slice of 400 or something. Yeah, we probably could. I mean, I guess that wouldn't be incredibly wasteful. Maybe we could see like what the the median size would be. You know, for example, like if somebody, if your average user is gonna have, um, I don't know. WGA does not pre-allocate. Okay, yeah, we, we won't bother either. I mean, that could be, I could leave that as like a to-do, right? So, uh, to-do, consider pre-allocating some memory to avoid a second system call if it proves to be a concern. Right. But in general, I'm good with doing the simplest possible thing first. So, perfect. Yeah, that, uh, wow, that, that SSHFS, that was, uh, that was an experience. <laughs> Amusingly, these iOctals are so much faster than the clunky Netlink Linux stuff. So two iOctals is really not a big deal. Yeah, Netlink is uh, it, it's its it's its own beast. Um, but I definitely appreciate it for the simplicity of the API once you figure it out. Uh, really need to fix that SSHFS setup. It happens way too often. Yeah, the problem is I'm running it in a terminal off the screen right now, and it's just gonna get wedged every time I reboot the VM. So I maybe there's some kind of way to make it smarter. But yes, you are you are right about that. It is not ideal. Thankfully, I don't think we're going to have to reboot again unless we find another bug, which could happen, you know, so. Uh, yeah, so let's cast the first part of this to the IFIO thing. Um, and take a look at it. So we're doing the assignment here. So now that we've got it out, we actually want to cast it back so we can begin inspecting this data. So uh, from the address of memory... Data interface is already nicely typed. Yeah, the problem is... Oh, right. It is in scope. I thought it was out of scope. Um, Data.interface. Yep. Gives us a struct with some stuff. So if we do... This is where the... Uh, you know, I'm going to figure out that ghost view thing really quick. I, I do want to get that back. Um, that is a helpful... I wonder if I just need to like put it in my module cache or something. Um, I don't know. Right. Yeah, that 51820 is the port I would expect. So, okay. Uh, spew dump data interface. And this ought to give us some nice, there we go. This ought to give us some nice output. Beauty, okay. We are in business. So as you will see here, we have the flags, which indicates which of these fields are set, the port, which is the listening port for WireGuard, our table, which is the equivalent of the firewall mark, I believe, according to the code that Matt wrote. We have our public key, our private key, and then the number of peers we have, which is one. So perfect. So now we can bring back some of the parsing code. Oh, just a sec. Oh, so the port is no longer in... I think before the port was in like a weird endianness. Now it seems to be totally fine. I believe that I saw a change in the tree the other day for that, but that's cool. That saves me a bit of effort, which is nice. The thing is, is that Go doesn't really like you to have the native endian. Okay, okay. Yeah, Go uh, Go has opinions about like endianness and stuff, and it's, uh, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's weird sometimes. But yeah, that's, that's perfect for me. I mean, it just it's an unsafe cast. It's native endian. That's, that's perfect. Works out beautifully. All right, so now we need to pass the, oh, so we need to pass the data interface and how much memory is beyond it. So maybe we wanna pass the, actually, I think we probably wanna pass the memory, right? We wanna pass the slice because the slice is going to have all of the data we need to parse, so. What am I? Just pass the interface and the length, maybe? The interface is peer count. The peers have a lot of IP count. Yeah, I suppose you're right. Um, so you should never go off the end. Right, right, right. So, uh, yeah, the name of the interface and data interface, right, which is a pointer. So actually the same types we had before. So this device, uh, this is all, I think this parse device code is stuff I had written. Did I write this on stream? I honestly can't remember, but uh, we have these flags in here now. So the flags specify, in the case of like 
in, in the case of Go, when things are not set, they are the zero value, which is fine. But I believe that's not necessarily the... Right, yeah, you're right. Yep, thanks. Um, but like in the, in the C interface, we want to know explicitly which fields exactly are set. So we have these flags and we do this bit mask here and we can check. Or we can do this, do this uh, bit set check. So we have those definitions. Uh, to do peer parsing, right. So we are at unit 16. Uh, I think I can remove the big Indian port stuff. Oh, I had it here too. Uh, we're going to need to look at endpoint again. This is code I had stolen from the older version. So the way the sock adder union is represented. Yeah, okay, sock adders need it. So the way the sock adder union is represented in Go is this array of 28 bytes. So we actually need to check the, excuse me, the first element of the byte slice, or the second element rather, uh, which tells us the families. So then we can check for IPv4, IPv6, do the rest of the casting. And we do need to figure out the zone for the case of like an IPv6 link local address, but we don't have that figured out quite yet. Yeah, the whole the whole endianness thing, like as far as like this uh, the sock adder stuff go, just like confuses me. You know, Go doesn't make it as easy as like N2HS or whatever. Uh, where were we at? 179. Let's type int. Uh, sure. Okay. So it's the correct Indian now. We just do the conversion. Cool. So I believe at this point we are pretty much where we were last stream. We now are parsing successfully some information from the device. We have the public key, the private key, which is hidden, the listening port, etc. Okay. So now we're going to start doing some new code. Uh, I have this parse peer function I was working on a little bit. So for each of these peer IO types, we need to unpack things in a pretty similar way. So the Receive bytes and transmit bytes, the last handshake time, which is a time spec. And on the OpenBSD 32 bit, this is actually a int 32, which is annoying. So I have to do this int 64 conversion to make it fit into time Unix, um, even though it's a no op on uh, AMD 64. We can cast directly into the key types, which is nice. Um, peer key will have interval in the OpenBSD interface is in seconds, right? I believe there's actually like a mailing list question about that too, and I wanted to verify, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it is, but I don't think I've actually bothered to set it yet. And then the endpoint. So yes, seconds. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I, I assume so. I just, I wasn't sure. I, I, I think it's seconds in all the other implementations or the other two implementations. So, uh, right. So parse device, we now have the interface IO. We have the peer count in here as well. So we need to iterate over each peer and this is where we need to do fun memory time. <laughs> so this is, this is where things get interesting. So the Seago struct generator cannot help us anymore because today I learned, oh, I can't pull it up on here. Can I? No, darn. The, the new structures have zero length arrays at the end of them, which I understand is a C idiom for essentially memory that can be like an array that can be allocated at runtime. Um, I'm going to get this totally wrong. I'm not, I'm not a C person, but what that basically means is we need to figure out how much memory we need to allocate for things like peers and allowed IPs ourselves and advance to the end of the structure and then begin parsing that data. So I think first we should, oh boy, we're going to have to convert this back to a byte slice. And yeah, this is going to be, this is going to be all kinds of fun. So uh, memory is a byte slice. No, it's going to be an array of bytes. And the array of bytes is going to be the size of a peer. So we're going to need to cast the, cast this to a, peer IO. So WHWG peer, peer IO. Oh, hey, uh, a nice little snippet of code I can borrow here that Jason was already writing. <laughs> Sweet. Thank you. Pair programming at its finest. Uh, let your Twitch chat program for you. Uh, yep. So WG IO peer. Uh, I don't remember what I called the, I think the type is WG peer IO. Yep. Peer IO, WGH. Yes, of course. Um, so the peer is this. And okay, we can make this smaller again. The problem with uh, programming in like, you know, size 20 font for stream is I suddenly have much less screen real estate than I'm used to. 
So, yep. Uh, okay, so breaking this down, we cast the data interface. Needs to be... Is that a pointer already? Yes. Yep, cast that to an unsafe pointer. Advance to the end of the structure. So plus 80 bytes, I believe this is. Actually, I have the constant for this as well. So WGH size of... Apparently, I forgot a parent. Okay, no big deal. Uh, interface IO, I have that constant already. Uh, and then plus I times, right, size of interface IO. So for I colon equals zero, I is less than uh, D peer count, something like that. I plus plus. Uh, what is complaining now? 187. That's uh that is quite the gnarly mathematical statement there. Ah, there we go. Okay. Um, I'm gonna break this into a couple lines here. Uh, that won't work though. That kind of loop will help you with a lot of IPs, but not here, sadly. Oh, you're right because the a lot of IPs can be variable length. Yeah, you're right. So to get the first one, we need to do this though. So this is gonna be. Yes, because peers are variable size, right? Right, right. So the first peer, let's let's say we're parsing one peer for now. Let's just let's just verify that our we're not you know, excuse me. We don't have any crazy off by one type of stuff going on. Um I don't like that formatting either. I guess I can go back to a one liner, but anyway. So the first peer will be located here. Oh, right, we already have it as the this form. Oh, yeah, so you can't do pointer arithmetic on unsafe pointer. You have to cast it to uint pointer. Um, <laughs> uh, so apparently auto mod, auto mod sees that as, oh, holy cow. Uh... Sorry about that. Automod saw that as a uh, spam. <laughs> uh wow, 76 messages, really? Uh no, the auto moderator did it. Sorry. Uh yeah, let me see if I can let me see if I can fix that really quick. That was uh That was obnoxious. I will turn off that setting for, for now since we're doing code in chat. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, that's uh, that's strange. Where are the commands dashboard? Settings. Spam protection. There we go. Uh, excess symbols, options. Uh... Yeah, I'll just turn that off for now. That's probably going to be, uh, that could be annoying. Sorry about that. <laughs> it did not work that time. It didn't like the, uh, it did not like the uint stuff for some reason. Okay. Oh, fun. <laughs> you forgot to link it to a PayPal scam. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, so as I was saying, we need to convert this to uint pointer before we can do pointer arithmetic. So this is an untyped constant. That should work fine. Uh, and then we need to convert back to unsafe pointer. So, yep, yep, yep. Done and done. And there we have what appears to be peer information. So let's go ahead and take a look-see. Um, we'll bring back the loop for now. We'll do an immediate break. Uh, I just want to break this down a little piece by piece. Uh, let's see here. So uh, if we do spew dump on a peer, 
So you can see now we actually have a peer with its flags, its protocol version, public key, pre-shared key, uh, persistent keep live interval, interval, CGO padding, the endpoint it's connected to. Is it not connected to the endpoint really? Um, hang on, WG. Oh, I think I have my machine paired. There we go. Right. So now we should see more useful information. Yep. So we have things like the, the endpoint in here. We have a time spec, which indicates the last handshake. So now we actually have legitimate stats we can check. So let's start unpacking that stuff. I have my peer parsing function die. Yes, I do. Perfect. Right, right, and right. So now we have one peer. Uh, I cannot use type pointer. Why did I pass the pointer? Probably because it was a... Uh, I guess I don't have to dereference it. I can just pass the pointer anyway. There we go. So we are now seeing my tool WG control, which is kind of a knockoff clone of WG show is parsing some of the same information that WG show is. So we are making progress. We now have a peer successfully parsed. So now we need to do the loop and make sure we can do the allowed IPs as well. Uh, yeah, cool. So we are about an hour in. I'm going to take a quick bathroom break. I'll be right back. All right, we're back. So yeah, this is a, this has been a pretty, pretty interesting stream so far. All kinds of, uh, very interesting go code, you know, stuff you don't get to write every day. It's actually a lot of fun. It's just funny though, because like this doesn't, this kind of stuff doesn't really come naturally to me. Like, I don't know if I have the, I don't think I have like the, the C mindset, you know, <laughs> but it's a good time. Here you go. Oh, did you already write working code? Holy cow. <laughs> so for each peer, for each allowed IP, uh, yeah, let's, let's go with that. <laughs> let's see what happens, right? <laughs> so, uh, Jason sent a nice little playground link. We'll have to, yeah, all right. Yeah, this is, this is what happens when you do a system call stuff, right? So, uh, okay. So peer, oops, what did I do? Anyway, uh, peer IO. No, I just want the whole word. What's the, what's the, this? Yes, so right. So peer IOs are all WGH, WG peer IOs. Yes. Um, oh, I added a double indirect, didn't I? Didn't I? Okay. WG peer IO. Uh, we can generate the size for the peer IO too. Um, and then the, we have the iFace IO and then we need the AIP IO. Okay, right, so AIP IO. E-I-E-I-O, if, am I right? Uh, A-I-P-I-O. Is that, is that what it is? W-G-A-I-P-I-O. Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, cool. So we can take the size of a few of these structures. Yeah, let's do that really quick. So let's generate, we can have the C thing generate so we can avoid a couple of like unsafe size ups, which is kind of nice. Um, WG. We need the size of the peer and the size of the allowed IPs, I assume, right? Yeah, we do. <laughs> oh, old Matt Donald's head of farm, E I E I O. <laughs> e E N X I O. <laughs> w G A I P I O. I'm gonna. You know, you know that thing where you, you start talking about something and suddenly it just kind of loses its meaning in your mind? I'm getting to that point with these uh, these names here. I know it's like totally logical stuff like peer IO, but WG peer IO. Peer IO. Yeah, OpenBSD loves tiny names. It drives me nuts. <laughs> yeah, it's not too bad. I don't, I don't mind the convention. I mean, Go loves tiny names too. Uh, Linux implementation has long descriptive names for everything. Yeah, there's definitely, I think as far as far as like the reference implementation, I think it probably makes sense to have that sort of thing, right? You know, 
but I'm also a great lover of super long lines. Ah, uh, yeah, you can see I've got my my 80 line uh, banner right here. <laughs> so because I, I do that on purpose, though, because that way I can have three, uh, three, at least three or four text files side by side on my display. Uh, let's see here. Really descriptive stuff doesn't really match well with 80 characters. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Okay, so now we have the size of each type. So we can... Oh, let's see here. Um, this is now a constant WGH size of WG... Was that an interface? Yeah, it was WGH the size of interface IO. We could also potentially give these constants some shorter names to tidy things up a bit, but this isn't too bad. So you went to pointer plus, yep, yep, okay. Uh, so we're iterating the uint pointers. Yes, so IFIO peer count. And then for each peer, we also need to iterate its allowed IPs. So. Oh, C spell. I need to, I should just turn that off. I like I like the idea of having like a spell checker, but it just never really seems to work out well with programming, you know? Like it just gets in the way. Uh, peer IO. Line 186 uses I Yes, you're right. Thank you. Uh, IFIO. And this can be a WGH size of WGAIPIO. Allowed IPIO. Oh, God. C spell. Okay. Um, spew dump AIP. We'll just dump a couple things really quick so we can verify. Okay, it compiled. That's, or it, uh, it checked at least. So, WGH that size of peer IOs. Uh, this is going to be AIP count, I believe, is the generator definition. Um, let's see here. AIPs, under, AIPs count. Okay. So, this is also going to be peer.AIPs count. So uh, needless to say, if you're writing this kind of Go code in your normal programs, you're probably making some some bad life choices. But when it comes to like kernel stuff like this, this is uh this is the name of the game. Sometime did I was this AIP? Yeah, okay, there we go. Just need to copy and paste or search for a place. <laughs> I write this in my normal programs. You're yeah, but you're a you're a kernel programmer by trade, right? <laughs> so you uh you're more used to this kind of thing than than me. Okay. Go run main.go. <laughs> WireGuard Windows is just thousands of horrible lines of this type of go. Nice. Peer count. Is it peers count? It probably is, isn't it? Uh, yes. So the go tool CGO code generator is quite useful, as you can imagine, but it doesn't generate the most like idiomatic codes. So you have to you have these like weird underscores and stuff like that, but that's okay. It's not like anybody's ever going to see this anyway. Um, 188, invalid operation is less than peer count. Peer count is a, should peer count be a uint pointer? I guess it could be. We could convert it to a uint pointer because that'd be, that'd be fine. And same with this. Because that way we don't have to do more conversions in line for the memory offsets. Uh, AIPIO. I'm pretty sure that's actually a type. Isn't it? W G A I P I O. W J W G A I P I O. Size of peer I O. No, it's size of W G peer I O. I stuck with the typical like conventions for this sort of thing. Uh oh. Uh, One ninety three. I thought for a second it was going to compile and I was going to be really excited. Uh, invalid. Okay, so we've got to probably. Uint pointer. Is there a parent in the wrong spot here? Yeah, I think so. Uint pointer. Nope. Uh, cast peer AIPs count to uint pointer. Ah, is that? Yeah, right here. I thought it was already. Or No, it's not. You're right. You're right. Okay. Yep. Hey, what's up? Okay. So now we have a peer. And we have an allowed IP. 
let's see, address family two. I'm going to take it. That means V4. Um, I see just the first four bytes populated. That looks something like a 192. Yeah, cool. So it's a size T, which is unit 64. Okay. Uh, cool. So let's add a couple more allowed IPs, I guess. Uh, I can never remember the syntax. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look it up. Actually, I guess I can modify my WG quick file, couldn't I? And yes, I'm going to use nano. I apologize. I, uh, this is a this is a VM. I don't care about Vim. I don't want to do that. Uh, let's add some V6. So FD, FF, dead, beef, dead, uh, colon, colon, size 64. Oh, okay, that's not too bad either. But this way, it'll, it'll be permanent in my config too, which is probably a good thing. Um, and we should probably make up an up here, right? So WG gen key piped into WG pub key. So this is just going to be a no op peer because we want to have more than one. Peer public key equals some stuff. And then the allowed IPs are going to be things that we don't really 192020. 24 uh, FE80. No, mm, we'll use the we'll use the global 2001 DB8 colon colon slash 32. Pseudo WG. Nope, don't need pseudo because we're on OpenBSD as well. Down WGO and up. WG show. Uh, local IPv6 address must be set to have routes. Did I screw that up? I could have sworn I have a local v6. I do. Oh, yeah, on the device, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, FTFF dead beef dead. Colon, colon, slash, 112, 64, 1. Sure. Weird OpenBSD routing quirk. I gotcha. Up. Okay. Uh, WG show. So now we've got a configuration that's more representative of what you might see. We've got dual stack. We've got multiple allowed IPs. We've got multiple peers. So uh, assuming all of Jason's logic is correct. Hey, there we go. That's looking good to me. Sweet. So, um, now we need to unpack all of the peers. Uh, let's see here. Unpack the peers, unpack the lot of IPs. Cool. Yeah, this is this is wild. This is the thing of beauty, right? I just want to print this out and frame it. <laughs> this is uh, this is the reality of unsafe go. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, peers. I can steal this line from down below. This ought to give us some output, at least in our command. <laughs> Wrong placement. Uh, what did I do? AIP declared. Start parsing peer on top. Ah, uh, yeah, you're right, because the initial peer. Right, right, right. Yep, so for each loop iteration, we, yeah. The last peer goes line to advance the pointer. Okay. Uh, so the air conditioning just kicked on here. If it's too loud, let me know. I can do something about it. But it's in this closet, unfortunately, so there's not much I can do. But I can at least quiet it down or, I don't know, figure it out. Yeah, it looks like there's a fair amount of noise in my audio, but if it's really annoying, just let me know, okay? Uh, right, so for now... We haven't actually done any allowed IP parsing yet, so cool. Uh, yeah, those are both of our peers, so perfect. Seems to work just fine. So next, we need to start parsing the allowed IPs. So to do, no more. This is going to be probably mostly a copy paste of this logic. Uh, well, not quite, I guess. So func parse allowed IP. W G H W G A I P I O. Types. Uh, no. What do I have this? Do I have this as a net IP net? I think I probably do. Um, I don't actually remember. It's been a long time. Yes, net IP net. Okay. Right. So, um, IPN colon equals net IP net. Uh, let's see. What does this have in it? So it has. You can probably go full screen for a little bit. Uh, 
So we have a address family, a cider, and an address. And I assume in the case of V4, it's only the first four bytes. Is this the same? Is this sock adders again? Is it? Because um, if it's just a sock adder, we can do unsafe. But I don't actually think it is, right? Oh, shoot. I don't want that. Uh, let's look at the... Let's pull up the C header really quick. Endpoints are sock headers, right? But the the a lot of IPs are not sock headers, right? Yeah, it, it is going to be a net IP. I was just curious if I could unsafe cast this instead of unpacking it. Was all, um, no big deal. Just cast adder to net IP, right? Right. But the thing is, is this is the in the the v4 addresses at least. It looks like it was just using the first four bytes. So I'm gonna have to check the address family and then parse out. Yeah. So, uh, switch AIPAF, Unix AF INET, and Unix AF INET 6. And probably a default panic case. Nope. For now. Because I don't like code that doesn't check for that kind of stuff. Right, so this is going to be return a net IP net that is the IP excuse me, the first four bytes of the array. So we can actually do, well, I guess we could slice it, couldn't we? So if we take AIP adder up to net IPv4 len, I know it's, I know we know what it is, but it's for tidiness. And then, is that gonna coerce automatically? Does go not have a dot, dot, dot operator? Uh, as far as like slicing goes, uh, it does not. So that's what the colon, the empty side of the colon is for. Uh, it does, it does, yeah, it does have variatics, but oh no, they don't work. They won't work in this case though. Yeah, I was thinking at first maybe net IPv4 as well, but I think this will work. Um, but yeah, it, I don't think it wouldn't work in this case. Like you can't splat a, I've heard it called the splat operator sometimes. You can't do that with. A function that, that doesn't accept a variatic so is my it has variatics but not splat yeah but it does have splat for things like append right unless that's just like some kind of implementation detail or something so unlike me Dominic has probably actually read the spec <laughs> so <laughs> you should ask him <laughs> I, I do my best but I can never remember which one uh, here we go but that's not splat. That's variatics. Oh, because splat would be splat would be what Jason is describing. Okay. Uh, cider mask. I can never remember if it's ones first or bits first. So it's ones first. Okay. So the number of ones is going to be the cider. Uh, shoot. So it's going to be AIP cider, and then thirty-two because this is a V4 address. And then for V6, we have similar sort of thing, which is actually going to be the entire address. So just sliced uh, into, I'm probably going to explicitly cast these, aren't I? So net IP to a net IP. Uh, where I split is having func f abc, and you can do fn args. Yeah, Go doesn't have that, unfortunately. It'd be kind of nice sometimes for situations like this, but is what it is. Uh, this is now 128, and these are going to have to both be cast into, is that, what is it, UN8? Oh, it's int, okay. Because these are n32s. Usually I would have Godoc up on a different monitor. I don't actually normally use multiple workspaces in my typical workflow, but we have no choice right now because we're streaming. So, go run. Missing return, 274. Uh, okay, now we're not. All uh, right, actually, I have to parse them. Um, let's see here. So, the allowed IPs for a given peer. Twitch needs multi monitor streams, one stream per monitor. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Uh, I wonder. Yeah. I mean, I guess potentially what I could do is I could have it so that I have different scenes on each monitor, and then I could have, like, you know, my fancy stream deck I'm going to build, uh, you know, switch scenes, but meh. I would be, 
I would suspect that most folks are probably watching this right now on their laptop screen. Yeah, all the transitions might get confusing. That is true as well. I suspect most folks right now are probably watching this on like laptop screens. Like not everybody has three 27 inch 4Ks, <laughs> you know. I'm a little excessive, but I never claim not to be. So, uh, let's see here. So the current peer, uh, we need to insert its allowed IPs. So uh, d dot peers at oh let's see here len that's len d dot peers. Minus one. This is going to be one of those stupid off by one things. I never get this right. I, I guarantee I got this wrong. Guarantee it. We will we will see soon enough when it panics. Uh, right. Allowed IPs. Allowed IPs. Equals append. That same gobbledygook I just wrote. Uh, with a parse. AIP. I don't think we need this anymore because now we got most of the types figured out. Oh, nice. Uh, chatting on mobile, watching on large TV. Otherwise, I can't read any of it. Yeah, I was curious how this would work on mobile. It's unfortunate. So I've got my font size up to 20 right now, which I feel like is pretty viewable. Um, but yeah, the thing is, is like mobile programming streams are just hard, you know. But hey, thank you for tuning in. And, you know, thank you for chatting. I appreciate that. You know, it make, keeps things uh, interesting for me. Hey, that worked. Uh, why not just do parse peer at the top, call it peer, and then append it at the bottom? Uh, yeah, we could do that. That's probably the probably the easier way, huh? Simplicity, simplicity wins. Uh, p allowed ips append p. So since we know the length here, we could actually pre-allocate these slice this slice as well. Um. We could pre-allocate both of these. Uh, IFIO peers count, right? And then uh, P allowed IPs equals make array slice. WG, nope. Uh, net IP nets. Uh, peer AIPs count. Yes, 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 and yes. So, Jason and Matt, are you sufficiently horrified by Go yet and what I have to do to make this interface work? I know, Jason, you've done a fair amount of Go as well, so you're probably a little less horrified, but... <laughs> uh, 194... Let me guess. There we go. Uh-oh. What did I do? Oh, I see what I did. Uh, so, I... Zero. No, no, no. Uh-oh. Don't append. Oh, uh, yeah. So that's actually what I just fixed. So right now I am creating a slice with length zero, but this capacity. So now append will work as you'd expect. Yeah. Yeah, that was just uh, that was just a silly mistake. But now it should... Oh, it does not work. Um, hmm. Oh, I forgot to append the peer. Right, right. Uh, D peers equals append. Uh, D peers with P. Yeah, that's what I meant to do in the first place. I just forgot. So this is a... Uh, there we go. Cool. So handy little trick in case anybody hasn't seen it before. So if you know the amount of something you're going to have in a slice, uh, you can allocate the slice by specifying length, the zero, but the appropriate capacity. This will reserve enough space for the elements that you're going to, to append into it. And then append will do the right thing because the length is set to zero. The problem is when I do the two slice format, it's setting the length to whatever the value is. So we have... Uh, length one, capacity one, and then it was appending it to element two, which is wrong. So, fixed. All right, cool. Uh, we have pretty pretty good output here. Um, we're, looks like my machine dropped off. There we go. Okay. And, beautiful. So we can see 20, 25, 13. Yep, it looks about right. Same allowed IPs. Uh... I'm going to call that a success. So it would appear we have successfully implemented the parsing API. Sweet. So now the goal is going to be to try and write sane tests for this. So effectively, the tricky part is going to be this. So we need to build a structure in memory, probably going to make some kind of helper function that like concatenates a bunch of things. Uh, we need to build the appropriate structures in memory and then line them up to back to back. 
in order for them to be parsed successfully by this code. So that's going to be fun. But it's only 8.30, and we got through the... Oops. We got through the first portion of parsing things out, so I feel pretty good about that. Uh, let's see here. Right. Um... Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna shorten these lines. I apologize. <laughs> I like my I like my 80 characters. I'm a stickler. Uh, let's see here. So we know how many peers we need to allocate. So prepare the slice and set our pointer to the beginning of the first peers location in memory. to account for so reserve the space and advance the pointer through each GAIP WGAIP structure cool cool um. <laughs> Prepare for the next iteration. This is like effectively like a do while loop in a way. But, oh man, I was thinking about uh, CS classes. Some of us were talking on the Gopher Slack about what our what our CS classes did and did not teach us. So, for example, we were not required to use version control until the fourth year of school. Uh, they took one day in computer science two and taught us SVN uh, barely, and then. My friends and I used Dropbox for a while for version control, and that went about as well as you can imagine. So, <laughs> would not recommend. Cool. Okay. Yeah, don't don't use Dropbox for version control. Just don't do it. It's not worth it. Uh, yeah, the configuration portion is still read only. Um, we're gonna get to that. We could probably do that on another stream. It's gonna be. Effectively this, but in reverse, like building some of these structures and putting them back in there. So perhaps we can refactor out some of the stuff that's in the tests, which would be nice. So, All right, time to write some docs. Uh, first peer. So here, I mean, I guess we could return an error, but no endpoint configured. Yeah, I wanted to I wanted to reevaluate this too. This is old code. Excuse me, I had written before. Um, let me get rid of the hoodie really quick. This is old code I had written before, but I think that we could probably. I think we should probably verify the address family and not just assume default means nothing, but. At the same time, if the kernel module hands us like a value that is neither of those, then something is very wrong. I mean, so maybe a panic is merited, right? Like that's kind of my philosophy is if something is, you know, uncorrectably wrong, then a panic is often the right choice. But, hmm, I could be wrong. I guess for now, do we have panic F in this package? Uh, let's see here, panic. F. Would it crash anything else? Well, I mean, if the... Let's presume, like, you know, if there was a some kind of bug in the kernel module or similar, like, I guess we'd want our program to crash probably right versus trying to continue with possibly bad input. Um, I don't know. I just I usually like panicking in these situations. Like, I, I feel like some people are pretty averse to panics and go, and I'm, I'm just not at all. I, I think that there are often worthwhile, you know, for, for these sorts of circumstances. So, 
Uh, let's see here. WG open BSD. Invalid. Address family. Or allowed IP. So plus B. We'll just give the whole structure so that way we can see more information. Uh, if you can't trust the kernel anymore, everything else out the window. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But also, I could try and, like, you know, force these conditions to happen in my tests and then, you know, do proper error, ha error handling instead. So, wait, did that work? No. Oh. Yep. Yep. So, panic F. Due to your success here. Oh, you just tag a new version. Nice. Cool, very cool. Thank you. <laughs> that is until WireGuard starts supporting IPX or something. Uh, Jason, so that's on the roadmap, right? <laughs> OpenBSD ports tree opens tomorrow or so, so now they'll update to that. Cool. <laughs> I mean, what was it? Uh, somebody proposed... I think I saw a what looked like a serious proposal for IPv10, which is like some kind of crazy uh, hybridized V4, V6 monstrosity. Uh, you know, one of those RFCs somebody submits and then never gets around to like revising it all. Like they submit it once, get a bunch of comments, nothing ever happens of it. Um, I guess we'll pull this out. It's kind of silly, but return at IP now. Because the compiler cannot infer that panic F never returns. Um, again, this is something that... Oh, here we go. This is something Rust can do. You know, Rust can Rust can have a, di a divergent function, but Go cannot do that, so... Makes me sad. Cool. Uh, we haven't touched the test at all, have we? So I'm guessing none of this is going to compile... Oh, I'm trying to run it on Linux. Nothing will compile anyway. Okay. Yep, we're going to have to rework things. Two calls per device. Yeah. I think we have to rework this assumption as well now that we have a loop, actually. Let's see. So the first call returns the size of... Yeah, I had this hard-coded for what we were working with last time, the assumption that there were no peers. So we're going to have to fix that. Um... We're gonna have to add this functionality. We're gonna have to pack those structures. Let's let's start with nonsensical number of bytes. <laughs> yeah, let's let's comment out this individual device test and go for the case above really quick. So we need to fix this up. Hmm. I'm trying to think of how I want to tackle this. I mean, basically, we reworked a lot of this logic. Some of the variable names are different. We might just want to keep this uh, if group rec thing, but... Oh, yeah, so I think I mentioned this last stream, but just in case somebody wasn't here. So this was, this IF group rec thing, this was, uh, this is kind of my nemesis, right? So <laughs> what I had to do is copy the C structure and create my own go underscore IF group rec thing that has padding before and after the discriminant in the union that I'm using. So, for example, I need this IFG rec, which is a structure, which is a pointer to IFGR groups. I need this field to be a pointer type considered a pointer type to go because otherwise it's possible for the garbage collector to no longer infer this as a pointer and possibly move things around. So this was this was a lot of fun. 
We should build a tool that fixes this, though. I... I think I mentioned this to you before, like Dominic at least, but it would be awesome if we had a tool that like could generate structures like this. Like given a union will generate the appropriate structure and padding for all the other fields for each possible discriminant. Is is that what they're called? I usually call them variants, I feel like, but I'm not a I'm not a computer science person. <laughs> you know. But that would be that would be a super nice tool to have. So if anybody's looking for something to do. Oh, first time I'm hearing this. Okay, yeah. Nested unions, exponential explosion. Yeah, true. I mean, but if you need to interface with all those different types, then it is what it is. I had to do something similar for the, oh, what was it? Uh, AFTIPC on Linux. I can't remember what TIPC, TIPC, I can't remember what it stands for, but I had to do something similar to get that working in XSYS Unix. I actually created like three different struct types in an interface that mimicked what the union was doing. Um, that was pretty fun. <laughs> That could be uh, for, for another day. So these no longer, this assumptions no longer, no longer holds. We need to, the first time around, we filled the data size. And the second time around, the caller needs to pass us memory to fill out. No op, nothing to fill out. What, what? Was I not checking the, oh yeah, right. This test was just testing the very basics, like, you know, given some devices create the very basic definitions with no information about the interface as if the interface was totally unconfigured. So, uh, right. So, uh, I guess we can do on an even call, or at least on the first call, we would expect to populate the, populate this. On every other call, we would expect that the caller has already given us enough memory. And I, I do suppose we could add a test case somehow for the structure size structure size change while in flight that Jason had mentioned. So let's let's write a to do for that for sure. The data size field changes between call one and two. So the caller must loop again to allocate, determine how much memory to allocate for the memory slice. Hmm. So for now, we're going to assume that the first call, we always give them the correct size, which is going to be just the interface IO for this because there are no peers at all. So that's actually fine. Um, is this does this test pass already? Is this fine? Uh, yeah, we'd expect one zero. Yeah, and call zero, call one, and then too many calls. At least for now, this is the the very basics. Panic F redeclared. Ah, right. Yeah, I tend to use this little helper everywhere. I wish it was built into the standard library, but I suspect it's not because of the reflection dependency. Uh, fail. Uh, too many calls to Ioctal. Why would it call too many times? Oh, did I not give it enough data? Yeah. See, we we changed some of our some of our assumptions here when we when we changed this code. So. So on zero, we pass back the number of bytes. So the caller knows they need to allocate 80 bytes of memory. They have zero. We do the check. It's going to pass this check. They allocate 80 bytes of memory and they populate, shoot. They populate this structure for us and call to us again. So that's call two. So now the length of memory should be the size that we pass them. So they should break from the loop and not do any more octal calls, right? Yeah, so why are they calling me twice or three times? Percent plus V. Hmm. <laughs> 
Oh. I plus plus. Zero one zero. Oh, it's because it's doing two calls per right, right, right. Okay, yeah, I'm I'm dumb. This is this is silly. So this was right before. So the problem is here is I'm fetching information from two different devices, and I I totally undid that logic. So on calls one and or zero and two, and then one and three. Yeah, so that was that was correct before. Yep, test pass. Uh, let's check the coverage profile. I suspect I know what it's gonna look like, but I'm just curious at this point. So go test dash cover dash cover profile cover dot out and then we can do the ssh ssh fs funsies uh, internal wg open bsd go tool cover which browser window is this going to open in probably the wrong one it always does yep okay one sec Yeah, so I think this testing setup is kind of cool, right? Because we're actually able to swap out these entire functions. Uh, how's the font size in that? I'll bring it up to the usual. I think it's kind of cool because we're able to effectively emulate what the kernel is doing by kind of populating the memory in the same way. So as you can see, we are fetching the device names and then passing them back. Uh, the color will hand us this. We have a test case here where we verify things like uh, Eno TTY. So for example, if you pass a an ethernet device to this WireGuard API, it returns Eno TTY, which means the IOCTL is inappropriate for the device. Or there's ENXIO, which means no such device, um, which we also map to air not exist because that is the contract provided by WG Control Go. Um, yep, so no flag set to be expected. There are no peers, there are no allowed IPs. So this is exactly what we'd expect. Cool, that wasn't hard at all, oops. It's really weird. Sometimes my keyboard shortcuts make things jump to the wrong monitor, and I have no idea why. Um, oh, there we go. Let me find you all. Okay. So now we need to update the other test in very much the same way, and then start adding more structures to it. So let's get it compiling, and then we start adding peers and allowed IPs. One thirty-seven, thirteen seventy-six. Uh, right. This is no longer data mem. This is now data interface, which is already a WGH interface I/O. So I don't have to do any of this unsafe anymore. So data interface equals. Uh, dereferencing the pointer, right now. Address of. I think I am being silly here. Oh, hang on a sec, go test. Oh, that passed. Sweet. Uh, 36895, oh, this is an NDN thing, isn't it? Yep, here we go. So now it's native NDN, so uh, we can just pass port 8080 directly, which is nice. Hey, that was very easy. And what's cool is we got rid of that unsafe uh, assignment on the left-hand side, which is nice. I kind of love the unsafe assignments, though. It's just, uh, it feels like a very tricky and fun thing. Like, I just get a kick out of, uh, where is it, right here? This line of code. So this IFG groups is a, uh, what is it? I think it's like a pointer to, IFG groups is a pointer to an IFG rec, but we know there's actually more than one of these. So we're like, okay, so this single object is now an array of N of these things. And then we go ahead and just assign an array there like nothing is wrong and <laughs> it works, which is uh, pretty cool. So, Fing Longer followed you. Nice username. That's pretty funny. <laughs> I forget what uh, what show or movie that's from, but I, I remember that. Very cool. Okay, so now we need to figure out how to pack in a data structure that it looks the same way as the kernel is doing. So I suspect probably what's going to be easiest here is some kind of weird, some kind of weird, like empty interface thing that takes some of these different structures and then marshals them to like a byte format and then just appends them in an array. I think it's probably going to be roughly what we're looking at here, but 
Uh, let's say we want to add our first peer here. Okay, so this data interface now, we actually need to cast to, actually, we should probably commit this where we are, right? Before we, we should probably, now that things are passing and such, uh, we should at least checkpoint our work a little bit. Go build, go test. Uh, see, Dominic, this is where I don't trust test, ca test caching. I just assume that, you know, something is wrong, but in that particular case, it probably wasn't necessary. Anyway. Um, let's do the old git commit thing. Yeah, we don't want spew in our go mod. It's so annoying. I wish there were a way to get rid of the go mod modifications for stuff. Um, go back, git diff. Consider pre-allocated memory. Oh, we need to get rid of that log call too. Let's give this one more once over. Yep, yep, thank you. Yeah, debug logs. I I always nitpick when other people commit them, and I'd rather have them gone as well. Um, Now this is out of date. So point the kernel, or slice this backing array. And the loop continues. We will verify, check if we've allocated enough memory. So now that I'm looking at this, this is infinite loop. Is it reasonable to add some crazy upper bound here or something to verify we don't I mean not that I expect that the kernel would not not that I expect the system state would change enough times where we would this would be a problem but I guess perhaps on a very busy machine like how many times do you try right let's see let's see what uh let's see what the C code does we haven't opened the C code tonight so where do I have that stored? Uh, temp wire guard. Oh, no, I think I have under git zx2 wire guard. Uh, okay. zx2 c4. Uh, what was it? Wire guard open BSD. Yep. Yes. Hey, IPv6. Nice. Love it. Wire guard open BSD. Oh no, I don't want WireGuard OpenBSD. I want WireGuard tools. Sorry. That's that's why I don't that's why I didn't have the repo already. Uh, pull. Oh shoot. Git diff. What did I change? Oh, stupid C formatting stuff. The VS Code extension. Oh gosh. What happened? Git status. Was there a force push on here? There might have been. So this is one of those scenarios where I can never figure out how to, how do you get pull and just say, okay, don't care about my changes. Uh, get pull force. Uh, get fetch all, get reset. Okay. Get fetch. Is that uh, too low? Hang on a sec. Get fetch dash dash all. And done. Okay. Now we are up to date. Yeah, so I was looking at this in the... Uh, okay, here we go. This is where we're at now. So for each peer, kernel set device. I was looking at that too. It looks like this will just, uh, it looks like this code just continues until it gets enough memory. 
Is this a is this potentially problematic? Because on a very busy system, would it be possible for the state to keep changing frequently enough that this will loop forever? I guess so. When I when I saw this originally, my assumption was that the kernel probably had some kind of like lock or something. But if that's not the case, do we have to care about that, or is this not a big deal? Hmm. I mean, I guess for now we can just uh, continue on, but just something I wanted to think about, I guess. All right, cool. Well, uh, yeah, let's check when our work. That seems like a seems like a good idea because we've done quite a bit. So I like looking through the diff to verify that everything is mostly sane. All right. Excuse me. Just one of those things where you want to uh, take a quick look and verify that. Did I remove that big Endian port helper? Oh, no, I still need it for the uh, right, for the endpoint parsing, because these actually are big Endian. Right, right, right. Let's bring this. There we go. Yeah, this is a, this is a thing of beauty. I think that if I ever end up doing a advanced unsafe pointer talk, this would be a pretty fun thing to uh, share, right? <laughs> All right, cool. I believe we are in good shape to commit this. Get status. Um, yeah, we can at least commit it and then begin writing the tests immediately for the rest of stuff. <laughs> the core file. Yeah, I think if config is a little borked at the moment. So git add and gc m turn on wg open bsd. Uh, implement ioctl plus arrays API um, initial peer allowed IP parsing. Should I do this on a branch? Eh, I guess it's probably fine on master. I mean, in theory, anybody who's using this code will be uh, specifying an environment variable anyway to actually access it. So let's see. Uh, yeah, I want to check out the I want to check out the CI build just in case because I have a tendency to break these things and then not notice for <laughs> a while, which is not really great. So, what are the pull requests on this right now? Oh yeah, I need to take a look at this. Um, somebody contributed example code, and then we also have a somebody who wants text unmarshalling, I believe, which is kind of nice for JSON. But the thing is, is I have a hard time deciding if it's worth pulling in that stuff upstream, you know. Because how many people are marshalling these things to JSON? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. I tend to create my own structures whenever I marshal that kind of stuff, but that's me. So we would expect the Linux and FreeBSD builds to continue to pass. The OpenBSD build, unfortunately, does not yet um, does not yet pull in this kernel module. As far as I know, there's no way to live patch an OpenBSD system, so we can't just dynamically. Uh, build and insert the kernel module, which would be great, but I don't believe that's possible. Um, if it were, that's effectively what we're doing on this Ubuntu and such. Like, we're actually just installing the uh, WireGuard kernel module from PPA and everything, and which is cool. Although I believe we don't need the PPA now that it's 2004. I guess I'm not totally sure. Oh, this is locking up a little bit. Yeah, we're building a, building a kernel module in CI. All kinds of fun, right? Yeah, these are going to take a bit. Okay, uh, let's move on. 
Okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions? We've done a lot of pretty wild stuff tonight. In particular, you know, this uh, <laughs> this unsafe, unsafe awesomeness here. Um, yeah, pretty tricky. But if you think about it logically, like the way these are laid out in memory back to back, we're just kind of advancing our pointer through memory, reading a record at a time. And then, you know, whether it's a peer and then each of their allowed P's, allowed IP's, excuse me, and then another peer. Um, pretty cool stuff. Uh, yeah, uh, once again, the AC just kicked on. Let me know if it's too loud. Uh, nobody complained last time, so I suspect it's probably okay. I can see it registering at least on my meter, but it doesn't appear to be nearly as loud as my voice, which is good. So, one of those things I wish I could fix but there's nothing i can really do in this place unfortunately so now we want to start actually parsing these peers so hmm let's see if we can get kind of the basics of this working at least tonight so i've got a hard cut off by 10 tonight so one more hour at the most of streaming um but if we can get to a good stopping point i might stop a little earlier uh so i can go just hang out and chill but let's see what we can do so now we need to pretend like this interface here is actually much longer than it is because it's actually going to be containing a lot more data. It's going to contain the size of an interface IO plus a peer plus allowed IPs. So I guess we could hard code that for now. Um, so for example, we have one peer, the peer has two allowed IPs. So, uh, size of WG peer IO plus WGH size of WG AIP IO. Two times. We have one device with one peer, one device. One peer and two allowed IPs associated with that peer. So that math will check out. It's probably worth doing some cases where we have more than one of each of these things. We could probably expand that later, um, but for the time being, this is probably okay. Uh, right, so now the caller is passing us more than enough memory. So we have this WG interface IO. We actually have to assign to this as if it were a byte slice. So again, I think we're going to have to write some kind of like crazy unsafe packing functions. This is going to be pretty fun. So what I have in mind is something like uh, pack. We're going to pack any number of things which are empty interface because none of these things have methods at the moment. Um, this is going to return a byte slice. A byte slice? Yeah. I mean, we're going to have to cast it to an array of the specified size. Yeah. Uh, let's just let's just see how this goes. So, okay. Uh, switch v dot type. This is going to be incredibly gross, by the way, but I don't really see a better way to do this. Um, it's just going to be a test helper anyway. But so I suppose what we want here is you have a device first of all, so. Uh, IFIO, which is a WGH interface IO. And then peers is going to be um, this isn't quite peers though, so this is just uh, data. I don't know. So the first thing we're going to do is unsafe cast that to an array of the appropriate size. So that is going to be a uh, WGH size of so now we have an array we need to slice into the array so I guess just to start let's uh, let's keep it simple I lose my there we go right 
internal and did we get the oh wrong folder okay i thought for a sec we got the sshfs mount wedged again which would be no good we need to bring this back down we need the vm run the tests okay uh yes correct that's wrong Cannot convert unsafe pointer to 80 bytes. Yes, because what? Oh, okay, wait. What's the trick here? To a pointer to 80 bytes, right? Yeah, and then dereference that, right? Right. And then I think we need to add more parents. Yeah, because you can't indirect the that. You have to indirect that. So now we have we are converting the WG interface I/O pointer to a pointer to an array of 80 bytes, dereferencing that, and then slicing that entire thing. So, right. I uh, can't stay too long. Wanted to hop on and say hello. Hey, uh, good to see you. Thank you for stopping by. We're having all kinds of fun with uh, unsafe pointer conversions here. So probably some of the some of the most interesting uh, Go code I've ever seen right here. <laughs> for sure. But it does exactly what it needs to do. So all kinds of fun. So we need to reinterpret this interface as if it were something. So first of all, hang on a sec. Uh, we need to peck this data so now this byte slice needs to be shoved into this interface so we need to reinterpret the byte slice or rather uh, index zero of the byte slice so is this gonna I think I might have to use an intermediate variable right so hey how are you uh, I'm doing really well having having a really good time how about you uh, we're, having, we're having all kinds of unsafe pointer fun tonight, for sure. So we need to interpret this byte slice we're passing back. We need to reinterpret the backing array as a WGH uh, interface I.O. Because that is what the type is accepting. So we're taking the interface I.O., stuffing it into a byte slice, and then indirecting it back. But we have to do that because we need to store other structures beyond the interface I.O. <laughs> so... This is definitely one of the most uh, interesting things I've ever done with Unsafe. Uh, hey, I'm glad you're here doing well. Thanks for thanks for hanging out. Appreciate it. So this is a pointer anyway. We need to indirect or convert this to a WG interface I/O. And is the test going to pass? Yes, the test passes. So now we have achieved an equivalent memory layout with more work. So now we can do things like append peers to this. So first we have the device. Uh, okay. Now we need to attach a peer. So WGH, WG peer IO. Oh, let's see here. What belongs in a peer IO? Um, this is this is a thing of beauty, isn't it? I'm pretty. I'm pretty excited about this. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> um. Okay. Let's go. Let's go full screen code browser. I need to be able to see all these definitions and such, and also what we're doing over here. So we want to check uh, private key, public key, probably everything, right? Yeah, private, public, port, R table. Where's the Where's the pre-shared key? Did I skip that? Did I skip that? As PSK. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong function. Wow, okay. Uh, public PSK PKA endpoint. So... Does this imply that it always has a private key? Did I skip the private key here? Did I forget something? Um, let's check the let's check the C header. Uh, first, let's... Okay, uh, that's good news. The CI build passed on something. Yep. So I've actually got some kind of cool integration tests here. What they will do is they will start up a... Let's go to the Linux one if we can find it. Uh, which one of these... Which one of these is Linux? There we go. This is Linux. Okay. So in these integration tests, we actually do something pretty cool. Um, we install the kernel module. We also install WireGuard Go. We <laughs> tell it, I prefer buggy user space to polished Kmod. And we actually spin up... Um, excuse me a kernel interface as well as a user space interface. And we run the same tests on both of them using the same API so we can verify that things work exactly as we expect, even with different devices. The 
which is uh, super cool. So, what did I come over here to look at? Was it the Git repo? Oh, the header, right. Okay, uh, git.zx2c4.com, uh, openbsd, the tree, if wire guard. So, peer has, I think I skipped some of these keys, didn't I? So, uh, we might have forgot the, oh no, there isn't a private one, is there? Yo, what's up? Hey, uh, hanging out, having a good time. Doing all kinds of fun wire guard stuff. So peer removing peer update. Yeah, we'll need those later on as well as replace a lot of IPs, but okay, there is no private key flag. So I wasn't forgetting. Do you know how to do logic deduction? Uh, as in like proofs or like formal math stuff? Cause not really. That was probably one of my worst uh, college courses. <laughs> so unfortunately I'm probably the wrong person to ask about such things. Oh, I'm, I'm silly. So you don't have the peer's private key. The peer has its own private key. The device has that. So, <laughs> same. Yeah, that was, uh, I, I remember doing like mathematical induction and that was, that was a nightmare. There was one time where I, we did a homework assignment and I'm pretty sure my friends and I had like 10 pages to turn in. This was the, uh, was this discrete mathematics? Yeah, I think it was like discrete math and like proofs. Um, so we did like 10 pages of homework. It was like 12 problems and the professor decides to grade one problem. So she looks at that problem. You know, I, I get my paper back and I've got an entire page of stuff, like all this stuff. And what she has is just a slash through it. Zero out of 10. Nope. So I got zero credit on homework. I spent literally hours doing because I just didn't know what I was doing in that class. That was, uh, that was brutal. I am glad I didn't fail that one, but that class sucked. Would not recommend. Uh, so we need to specify all of these flags because we want to... Happening to me right now. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I remember that. Um, why did I spend the time on it? Uh, because I wanted to learn and I wanted to... I wanted to see what I could do. I, I thought I... Uh, I thought I had... I thought I had a chance, you know? Um, it's one of those things where you don't find out until after the fact that, like, you didn't... You had no idea what you're doing, you know, but that being said, like, you still need to try, right? Like, if you put in an effort, like, some professors will count that for something, right? Uh, this particular one did not, which was no fun, but what are you gonna do? Needless to say, I am glad I'm out of school. I've been out of college now for seven years, and I could not imagine ever doing homework or anything again. It was, uh, <laughs> it was an experience for sure. Protocol version one. Yeah, it's it's worth it though. I mean, it's pretty interesting. I've had a couple of uh, a couple of folks in my career tell me earlier on that like, you know, why don't you just drop out and work for this startup? And that's not, you can do that, but I'm not convinced that's a good idea for everybody, right? I, I think for me, what I gained from school, like you know, whether the education itself, some of the classes were helpful, what I gained from school was valuable. So I I think that it was worth it overall. Um, but there were definitely days where I was pretty sure it wasn't, you know. So peer is a, if you're focused in class, it's really easy. Yeah, to me, it just depends, right? I mean, different people have different strengths. Like for, for me, I had a, I had a pretty hard time with, uh, yeah, I used to be, I used to be pretty good at math and I, for some reason, just kind of lost that in school. And then I took a couple of like really tough classes and then kind of, you know, kicked my ass a little bit. And I realized like, wow, I'm not as good at this as I thought and it is what it is. It's unfortunate, you know, uh, are these arrays anyway? I think they actually might be. Yeah, they are sweet. Okay, so I think I can use this directly, actually. So, uh, public is peer. Yep, the public key of the peer. That is correct. Um, PSK is going to be the pre-shared key that I've also computed. Okay. This is going to be beautiful. This is going to work out so well. Um, beyond the PSK, uh, we need the PKA, which is peer keep alive interval. We will do... Uh, what did I have down here? 60. So the number 60, because that's going to be 60 seconds as the unit here. Uh, 
uh and kind if you're still around i think all things considered this has gone pretty smoothly so uh thank you for a pretty sane and nice api <laughs> it's definitely harder and go but this has been this has been a lot of fun so thank you uh there's nothing called smart or bad in math everyone can be good in math if they practice yeah that's true um i think that yeah i, I don't know i i did really well in math up until like a certain point Oh yeah, totally. No, no problem. I was just saying like, you know, okay, good work. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was just, I was just saying, uh, I, I, I don't know, like maybe I didn't put in the effort I should have. I, I, the thing is, is like in school, like every professor expects you to put 40 hours a week into their class, right? Like something crazy. It's just, uh, it's not going to happen. You can blame Jason for the nicer API. <laughs> I gotcha. Yeah, it feels, uh, it feels pretty good. Uh, we're going to need to convert the endpoint back to unsafe pointer stuff. So we'll figure that out shortly. Um, skip that for now. I guess if we get the rest of this working, we can at least prove. So TX bytes is, what is it? Transmits one, receives two. Yep, typical me. Uh, Rx bytes two. You probably couldn't even submit like wire guard datagrams that small, right? They'd have to be like at least a minimum of a IP v4 header, right? So like, you know, 40 some odd bytes. But for unit tests, it is totally fine. Time spec. Yes, yeah. That's that's what I figured. Just for, for unit tests, I'm lazy, so I do stuff like one and two. Unix time, one, two. How perfect. Uh, sec one and sec two. Our very own time spec. Oh, WGH time spec, right? And the count of the allowed IPs, which is going to be, uh, let's say zero for now. Let's just verify this parsing logic works. So, to do. Okay. Um, We can close a couple of things. Uh, get back over here. Uh, yeah, man, if you get to work, uh, no big deal. I think at this point, we're probably, you know, I think we're in good shape. We're pretty much just doing go stuff and tests, but I appreciate you stopping by. You know, this is uh, this is super cool. I'm excited to see how the open DVSD community reacts to all this, you know? Uh, the test pass, how is that possible? Um, oh, right, okay, we didn't actually enable the peer yet. Yeah, okay. And the endpoint is also not set up because we need to do that. So, uh, oops, nope. There we go. Shoot. Okay, so no pure data. Oh, right, because we're not actually packing it into the slice. Right, right, right. Okay, so for each value within this now, we actually need to unpack it, do a type assertion, and fun. Okay, um... Oh, you know what? Doesn't this actually... No, it doesn't. Okay. So we are going to have to do a loop for uh, values. Values. So for the case of a peer IO, we are going to have to do another unsafe cast and then append that to our output. So we'll call this out. Okay, um, this is going to now be, we need the concrete type type. So unsafe pointer to a pointer to a WGH peer IO. So this is going to be the size of a peer IO. Uh, byte slice array. Uh, we need we need a slice because then we can append it. B declared not used, right? Uh, out equals append out with B. So we added a value to our slice, but it didn't work. Oh, I think we're 
Let's not tell the caller about any allowed IPs right now. Let's see. Okay. Um, what am I doing wrong? So we're packing the memory back to back. We specified, did we not specify any peers? We did not. That's probably why. So the interface IO tells us how many peers we have. Uh, let's order these the same way the struct does. Flag, port, R table, public, private, peer count. Peers count one. So now this should work. Awesome. That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow so we are sending go memory that is beyond the end of the structure that we're telling it it is but we know that it's allocated there so we can reach it anyway <laughs> oh that is that is evil that is like legitimately evil and i kind of love it um Oh, I missed the protocol version. Must be... I forget to parse that. Must be. Yeah, this is... Fan oh. Did I just not set it? I did set it. Oh, we're not checking for it, probably. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I probably added that field later on. Uh, protocol version is after the allowed IPs. Okay. Version one. Uh, nil versus, right, okay. Nil versus uh, empty allocated slice. Now that is super cool. So, wow, that's a, uh, it's a hell of a function. <laughs> okay. So let's pack. Well, let's let's do the endpoint. We need to we need to get that working as well. So we need to cast back to the sock adder. Uh, we need to cast the sock adder. Um, actually, can we use the same function we did before? I think we can. So this is a. All right, I'm gonna get water again. I'll be back in just a sec. All right, we are back. So I think what I was just thinking is we can actually repurpose the endpoint function because we need to pack the endpoint into 28 bytes oh we need the reverse don't we right we need well can we do a raw sock adder actually so i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure what this is actually is supposed to be like a raw sock adder i think i'm just cheating a little bit um but i think we could just pack it as a raw sock adder and it would work so Pack it and then do an unsafe cast to 28 bytes, I believe. Okay. We're going to do something really nasty here. So <laughs> a function that returns 28 bytes that we invoke immediately. <laughs> uh, Unix raw sock adder. Oh, boy. We're going to need xsys Unix. And of course, this is for Linux, but I think the definitions are mostly the same, right? I mean, family and data. Okay. Or no, we don't want a we don't want a raw sock adder, do we? We actually want the typed family one because the raw sock adder would be the raw representation. So I think I want like a sock adder inet four. So family port address. Okay, something like that. So the family is AF INET, which is IPv4. Um, so if we do, I guess let's just verify our logic here really quick. So I would expect that this type would be 28 bytes in size. Uh, I can't verify that on, I mean, I can look at Linux, but this is Z types Linux. Well, I guess we can pull up the, hang on a sec. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm going to want to, clone the latest copy or x sys get pull right 
So we want the raw sock header, inet4 for OpenBSD. Uh, Z syscall, OpenBSD, AMD64, raw sock header. Uh, hello, inet. Uh, maybe Z types or types OpenBSD. Raw sock header. Uh, no, I want the generated code. So syscall. See, I can never remember which one of these files it actually is. Z syscall. No, that's where I just looked, right? Z syscall. G, uh, Z. Wow. Ugh. Z syscall. No. Uh, crap. Raw sock header. Four. Still got four years to go to college. Are you in college right now, or did you just graduate high school? Maybe. OpenBSD. Syscall, OpenBSD. Is it here? No. Where does this live? I'm pretty horrible at like code search, especially in big, nasty. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, I mean, you got, well, you've got plenty of time to like figure stuff out, but would recommend, uh, would recommend doing the doing the college thing. I mean, I guess it's not for. Oh well, wow. okay. So you're a lot younger. Cool. Uh, well, welcome. Uh, are you just a hobby programmer, or you just uh starting to learn, or what? Dash R. Socket or inet four. Z types. Oh, cool. Yeah, I mean, like, I think that's pretty much how most of us most of us got our start here is just by, um, you know, you, you find a problem, you, you do something you want to, you know, figure out. Like, you know, for me, it was PHP. For lots of folks, it's things like, you know, Python or Ruby. Um, there we go. Okay. Length family port. Address. <laughs> yep. <laughs> a few... Uh, yeah, a few folks in agreement there. Yeah, I think I started like uh, I started with PHP actually doing like super basic dynamic website stuff, and that's actually what I did early in my career as well. But I, at the behest of a friend, learned to go, and I've never looked back. Pretty much, um, I think that you know clearly every language is good for certain things. Uh, I think in my particular case, Go is very good for the kinds of problems I like to solve, which is weird networking and systems things like this. So, uh, yes, I know that. So we need to fill this out the same way. So the length is going to be uh, is the length of the size of the raw sock header. I actually have no idea. Okay, so it is the length of the raw sock header. Weird. Okay, size of raw. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I just, uh, having to construct these these uh, union things on my side in tests is very strange. Uh, is there a size of constant for that? Size of raw sock adder inet4. Does that work? Does that compile? Nope. Okay, so we can do unsafe size of. So, unsafe size of uh, unix raw sock adder inet4. You know, there was talk at one point about adding a size of, I think, somewhere else that wasn't unsafe because people are kind of allergic to the unsafe name. Um, I wonder if that ever went anywhere. Yeah, this is a uint pointer. It needs to be a uint 8. Um, oh. Uh, first work I did in computer programming. Yeah, totally. I think a lot of people get started with, like, websites and stuff, you know. Um, especially, I guess these days maybe there's a lot more, like, front-end stuff. But when I was doing it, like, basically you were expected to do, like, pretty much everything. And, like... You know, everybody that did, like, PHP and, like, some JavaScript, stuff like that. But uh, finding myself that every time I start learning programming, I get into it so hard, and after a week, I start slacking. Yeah, I mean, you have to find the right balance, right? I, I tend to go in phases where I'm, like, really into something. Like, right now, I'm really into programming again. Um, but the past, like, couple of months, like, I just put 150 hours into Persona 5 Royal. Uh, <laughs> oh, size of sock adder in 16... Okay, yeah, the thing is, is I'm worried, I'm worried these are different sizes on 32-bit, right? So I'm doing, uh, I'm going to do the size of, check the image on your side. Okay. 
I also, I don't think I've even bothered to, I don't think I have any code in here for like ARM or anything. I'd have to figure that out, like OpenBSD and ARM. I wonder if people use that. Um, that's something that we should try and get working. What was the port here? And this is big Endian, right? So I have to do the BE port thing again. Um, 1024. Okay. Oh, I was doing V6. Uh, we'll do, we'll do V4 for now. It's okay. Uh, four bytes, which is going to be 192.0.2.0. My favorite test address. And zeros is all zeros. So. Right. So I have to cast this now to return this as an array of 28 bytes, right? I guess I, <laughs> I guess I can just inline this whole thing, can I? Uh, here we go. Ready? A pointer to an array of 28 bytes that is an unsafe pointer that is the conversion of this whole thing. And go. Uh, can I use big Indian port as type uint16? Uh, sure I can. Hey, there we go. So now the endpoint we got is 192.0.2.0.10.24. Sweet. So it looks like this works. So we could do uh we could do v6 as well. Um, we should probably have a v4 peer and a v6 peer. Actually, would be the smart idea. But for the time being, um, I can steal this one nine two o two o. Heck yeah! Nice. <laughs> Uh, hoping to make a program that watches the stock market in two months. Cool. Yeah, I mean, so I think that integrating with like web APIs is actually a really great way to learn. Uh, I know for me personally, I was not that interested in most programming things until I started doing network stuff, like realizing that you can make, you know, computers work together or pull data from a server using like an API. Like those kinds of problems are much more interesting to me. So that's where I really kind of like hit my stride, I think. Uh, out of curiosity, did you find my channel because of like the the category, or do you follow me on Twitter? I guess I'm curious. Like I uh, I I feel like I you know usually have like Go community people in here, but I wonder if like the Twitch categories are working. So that'd be cool too. I'm always happy to uh, meet new folks. You know, we need to unpack the allowed IPs. Uh, yeah, if we can do that, I think we'll probably end up calling it pretty much a stream for tonight. Um, we have about 25 minutes. Just browsing on Twitch. Nice. Very cool. Sweet. So I'm, I'm glad the categories and everything work. You know, happy to happy to have you. You know, happy to talk about whatever pretty much. So we want a default case here because we want to make sure that any types that are passed here don't make sense. Uh, pack invalid type. We'll crash the test uh, because we do not want to mess with that. Um, this has to be a very restricted, crazy... Yeah, your name your name looked familiar. I just uh, I was curious how you discovered my channel. Um, I think a lot of the folks here are people who follow me on Twitter, perhaps, and I know we've got a couple of the WireGuard folks here as well. Um, I, I was just curious more so, seeing how the uh, seeing how that all worked. Heard about you from a friend from the KZ area. Oh, no kidding, huh? Somebody, so somebody I know in real life. <laughs> You're one of the few programming streams on Twitch chat that actually have code on screen. Yeah, I, uh, I've briefly checked into a few others and there's a lot of like games development stuff and I think that's cool, but it's not my, it's not my niche, you know, um, so two allowed IPs, uh, WGAIPIO. This, uh, this test is a thing of beauty. This, this pack function, this monstrosity I'm writing right here. I, I love this so much. <laughs> I don't know. I know I shouldn't like code like this, but I just really enjoy it. Oh, no kidding. Someone I know too. Also do a lot of lower level unsafe code. Uh, cool. Well, shoot me a, shoot me a, I'm really curious now. Shoot me a whisper or a message on Twitter. Cause I'm, I'm very curious. Uh, I'm very curious who it is that you know. Because I don't have very many programming contacts in the Kalamazoo area anymore. Um, I used to work for S2 Games here in town. That's the only place that I really had contacts. And I haven't worked there in six years now. So it's been a lot longer. Longer? When did I? I left S2 seven years ago. Yeah, it's been a long time. 
Oh, no kidding. Cool. Okay. Uh, most streams just chill on their stream, but on your stream you work. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is, like, I'm here because I want to solve this problem, you know? Like, this is interesting to me, is doing this crazy stuff. So, it's uh, it's a lot of fun. I get a I get a big kick out of doing stuff like this, so I'm I'm more than happy to share my knowledge. You know, the thing that I've realized is that like I I enjoy doing this stuff anyway, so I might as well do it on stream, right? I've actually had to kind of stop myself from working on certain problems because I want to be able to do them on stream, so I can share them with you all. Uh, Unix AFI net. So the first one's a V4, uh, needs to be a CIDR of 24, and the address is an array of four bytes. No, it's actually a 16, isn't it? Um, right, but only the first four are populated, so 192, uh, 168, uh, 1, and the rest are zeros. I guess I could do a zero for explicitness, um, but that that is what I would expect this to be, bytes. Uh, starting with one allowed IP, let's see how this unpacks. Did I, I already do that? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, yeah, so the only one missing now is the V6. Sweet. Extremely cool. <laughs> to be honest, I don't fully understand what you're coding, LOL. Uh, yeah, this is, a, this is definitely a very unusual topic. Like, the reason I'm here to share this is because I find it interesting. Um... But this is not the kind of programming you'll see every day. And in fact, some of my other streams, I've done stuff like things like web APIs that are a lot more, uh, I guess, approachable. Um, this, unfortunately, I would not consider particularly approachable. It is very, very dense. Not a lot of people do this. Yeah, I mean, for me, this is fun, right? Like, I, I enjoy doing this kind of strange stuff. Um, did I forget this? I, no. Oh, two allowed IPs. Right, 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 right. What's... Oh, shoot. Uh-oh. FD. What is wrong here? 6664. Is there some kind of... No, it's not an endpoint. I interpret the address literally. Uh, what does your coding do? So, I am... So, if I run this WG show, uh, this is the output of a AIPAF. Oh, did I did I type in the wrong address family? Nope, INET6. Um... <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll figure it out in a sec. But uh, so if I type in WG show, I am showing the status of the WireGuard tunnel VPN device on this machine. This is a virtual machine. So I am writing a Go client so people can write WireGuard stuff with their programs that does something very similar. So that's basically what I'm doing today is making it so people can program the VPN devices on their OpenBSD computers in addition to Linux and other ones too. So... Something I find fun. I'm not actually an OpenBSD user, but I am super happy to support WireGuard. Uh, and this is fun for me to learn something new. So why not? Uh, I wanted to print out that byte slice, right? Um, percent number X or percent space X. AIP address. So 2001 DB8. Yep, that's what I would expect. Can you create API? Yes, I definitely can. Um, that is something I did on a stream. So I don't know if I have my YouTube stuff linked yet. I do not. If you go to mdlayer.com and you click on the YouTube link, uh, I've got videos from a couple of days ago where I was working on the HTTP API for my project I call Core Rad. Uh, so if you want to check out that sort of thing, you know, feel free. Uh, otherwise, I'm sure we'll get back to that at some point. Uh, I've just been working on this for a couple of days now. But I also want to do this project, so this will be fun. <laughs> I'm going to have a hard time not doing that uh, off stream. I think I'm probably going to start that one off stream because there's just a lot to figure out. Go test. 6664. Yeah, that's not right. 
I get the feeling I'm like... What am I doing here? I'm at six. This one works fine. These are both 16 bytes. Yeah, the structures are the same size. It parses okay, so something is wrong with my test, right? Allowed IP IO, allowed IP IO, always appending. Hey, Dominic, am I doing something silly? <laughs> it's possible, right? Uh, let's look at the, let's look at the byte slice output here. Um, instead of looking at the parsing side, let's look at the print F percent space X B. I'm probably have one quarter paying attention. No, that's fine. I was just curious if you were going to spot something immediately that I was missing. Um. Six, 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 four. That's not... Oh, you know what I think I just did? I am really dumb. Um, yeah, this should be 0xfd. X, not ASCII. <laughs> yep, test pass. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, uh, I got sidetracked by the fact that IPv6 addresses have letters and was thinking in ASCII for some reason. So that was that was silly of me. And I should have I should have known that the first byte has to contain both the F and the D in the address as well. So uh easy problem to solve. But yeah, cool. So I think we're at the point now where this test passes, which is awesome. So I really do want to expand this with a, a V6 endpoint as well and another peer, I think. So we have a little bit more time. I think we can probably do that. Um Uh, from what I read, APIs are used by hackers if they know the email or IP address or phone number. It searches the internet for any social media or stuff they sign up for. Uh, no, not not quite. Um, I mean, certainly there are things you can use for like bad purposes, but in general, an API is just a way of like connecting different applications together. So, if you want to pull stock data, that would be using like an API, for example. But yeah, I mean, there are malicious things out there, or you know, things like APIs that have people's personal data, perhaps. Um, Got a message. Oh, this is this is an amazing function. Pack. Say uh, WG interface and trailing WG peer IO WG APIO values. In a contiguous, contiguous byte slice to emulate the kernel module output. This is kind of ridiculous how I, I created this function that basically does what the kernel module is doing <laughs> in, to some extent. So I need to... Uh, I wanted to add another peer that has a v6 endpoint and maybe like one more allowed IP. I think that'd be a good idea. So, okay. Oh, how is that working? Uh-oh. Two times. I was reading uninitialized memory. That's scary. I mean, it was just in the test at least. Uh, how long have I been working on this? So this project I started probably a year and a half ago. And as far as this code that I'm writing, uh, this was started on Sunday pretty much, or at least updated on Sunday. It was pretty much completely revised over the past year. Okay. Test still pass. Um, so let's see here. So you have a peer with two allowed IPs and then we're going to have a peer with one allowed IP. So we can copy and paste such things. This one's gonna be v6 only because v6 is the superior address family. Do not fool yourselves. Uh, 2001, 0x1, 
x01 to 0x db 0x8 0 and then uh, 0x01 128, sure. Um, 2001 db8 colon colon 1, right? I had to make sure I got my hex right that time. We didn't want a, a repeat of that last thing. So this peer will be much more minimal. It will have an endpoint, but no, neither of those. It will have a public key, sure. Um, peer A, peer B. Peer A, peer B. So it's going to have a public key and an endpoint, and that is it. And the endpoint will be V6 this time around. After all, for dinner, have a good evening. Yeah, hey, take care. Thank you for hanging out. I appreciate it. Uh, 16 bytes. So this will be... Can you connect a wire guard from localhost? Does that even make any sense? I was thinking maybe that would be a nice, concise thing to... I mean, even if you can't, I can say you are, right? <laughs> so, 0x01. Zero zero yes. Oh, you can. Interesting. I guess I've never even tried. But makes test easy. Yeah, totally. That's a... Uh, yeah. Hmm. I, I never even thought of that, but I suppose that makes sense. Uh, 2048. Cool. Uh, we're just going to go for the bare basics here. One. Uh, I guess the kernel module, well, it's okay. We can cheat a little bit because we are not the true kernel module. So peer B, there is no pre-shared key. The endpoint is localhost 2048. Localhost v6, so you needed the brackets. Fun, fun. Uh, nothing, nothing, nothing. Go away. Oh, the actual reason is that we're just using a regular socket, so it would be like netcat localhost 51. Oh, cool. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, you know, it's so funny. I feel like I've always tested it with two machines just like out of habit, but I suppose there was no reason I couldn't just uh, set up like a local pair. It's one of those things you just don't think about, you know? Uh, this is, right, 2001 db8 colon colon 1 slash 128. And I'd expect this to pass. It does not. Why doesn't it? Uh, two allowed IPs, two peers. That's why. Still doesn't pass. db80. Oh, I forgot the, so it's not db80, it's db08. Because the trailing zero is, or the leading zero is trimmed. Uh, 2001 DB8. Hello? What am I missing? Is it 80? 2001 DB8 colon colon. Zero DB8. Ah, zero DB8. It's the, it's the, the leading. So zero D... B8. That's the problem. Uh, last handshake is empty. I wonder if I should set that to... I should probably set that to the zero time for convenience. Um, what does this do if time unix is zero, zero? Well, so you want that and you got... Well... Time Unix is zero, zero. Oh, it's because it's in my time zone. It would be, hmm. I wonder if I should just set that to time, 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 time empty. What do I do in the other ones? I guess let's, let's check those to find out. Because Go has a nice type that lets you determine the uh, zero-ness of a time value. Parse time spec. Zero value, yep, okay. So we want to match the zero value behavior. So. Yes. 
So, PIO, last handshake sec, greater than zero, and PIO, last handshake, and sec is greater than zero. Well, I guess the nanoseconds one had to be greater than zero. Ooh, did we, wait, did we just find a bug in the Linux thing? So if you got zero nanoseconds, somehow it would not return the, yeah. <laughs> so if you actually managed to get a last handshake with zero nanoseconds, this would not return the time. <laughs> that's that's silly. Um, yeah, that needs to be fixed. So I'm going to do that for now, but wow. <laughs> One of those, I mean, shoot, what is it? How many nanoseconds are in a, uh, a second? Like... Or many trillions or something. <laughs> well, gang, we fixed a one in a trillion bug. One in a kajillion something. Last handshake is undefined. What do you mean? Last handshake time, I think I might have it labeled as actually. Yes, hey, all of the tests passed. Okay, uh, we are pretty much out of time for today, but let's check the test coverage and commit this, and we are good to go. So this has been a ton of fun. Very fun night for sure. Awesome. Internal WG OpenBSD, go tool cover. All right, got to bring that over to share with you all. So pretty much the only thing we don't have under coverage is opening the socket and closing the socket. <laughs> and then, of course, doing the real IOCTLs. But we will have coverage for those once we, uh, what do you call it, um, have the integration tests. So if we can find a way to either load the kernel module or wait for it to appear upstream, we can start testing it in CI. Uh, configuration is not supported. Yeah, this is looking good. Oh, we didn't test the no endpoint case. Hmm. Well, I guess I could add a third peer that has no endpoint and no IPs. Right? That'd be trivial. So public key only. Can you have a peer without a public key? I feel like that one makes sense. WG test must public key. Nope. Okay. So does that mean that this uh, peer has public flag is totally unnecessary? Could this be removed? Just out of curiosity. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't impact my code really? But uh, no endpoint and no allowed IPs. Perfect. So now there are three peers in here. So plus the size of a peer. And all this peer will have is its name and an empty list of a lot of piece, I believe. Uh, some nice uh, C code splunking, huh? Peer must have public. Oh, so it's used on the setting side, must be? Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Probably could get rid of it. Yeah, I mean, up to you. I, I was just I was just curious. Jason might know a reason not to. Okay, cool. Hey, thanks so much for hanging out tonight. It's been, uh, it's been super useful having you and Jason here to uh, answer questions and such. Uh, and with that, I believe we are good to log out of the VM and do the final code checks before we commit this. I need to fix that Linux thing. That's so silly. <laughs> but. Uh, that variadic function. It's the thing of beauty. Cool. 
Uh, with this, I am pretty confident to say the OpenBSD parsing portion is totally done. So, assuming you all don't change the API on me tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> but if we do, that's okay. It's been a lot of fun. Jason would kill me. <laughs> yeah, it sounds good. I mean, there have only been, like, what, like, three WireGuard tools releases in the past couple days. <laughs> Oh, let's see here. There we go. Um, yep, code is pushed. And with that, we are coming up right on about 10 o'clock. So, hey, uh, thank you all for hanging out today. It's been a blast. I had a really good time doing this. Uh, I hope you all continue to join me for these streams. I am having a really good time doing it. So, if you are interested in this sort of thing, you know, please do click that follow button. You know, like and subscribe, all that. Uh, but actually, though, I do need more YouTube subscribers so I can get a custom channel URL. So... If you want to do that, that would be great. <laughs> Alrighty, and with that, I will see you all later. Take care.